Hey everyone, Pickle Dill here. Happy 5,000 subscriber special. For this special, I'm going to cover a topic many of you have requested I do. What if Ash woke up on time? How have since this already been done by creators such as Enter the Unknown, Trainer Dino, Vegeta What Ifs, and Dex Comics, I will attempt to keep it a bit more succinct than my usual stories, while also putting a different spin on it. However, before we get into the story, I'd like to turn your attention to this analytics bar. Currently less than half of my viewers are subscribed, so please if you like my content, drop a sub and put a like on this video. Since it's free, tells the YouTube algorithm that you like what I do and it helps me to grow. Also if you really want to help me out, consider checking out my second channel where I do what ifs on non-Pokemon topics or heading over to my Patreon and supporting me there for early access to all my content as well as access to my Patreon exclusive series, What If Ash Used His Old Pokemon. The link to both of those are in the description below. But without further ado, let's start the story. Our tale begins in Pallet Town, during the wee hours of the morning. Ten-year-old Ash Ketchum is set to begin his Pokemon journey today, but right now he is fast asleep, dreaming of the adventures still to come. During his slumber, Ash's Voltorb alarm clock rolls from its perch and into his bed. However, here Destiny steps in, having the orb come to rest not in the boy's hand, but by his head instead, positioning it perfectly to wake him in a few hours when it rings at the prearranged time. Jumping up with a yelp at the noise right next to his ear, Ash is bewildered for a moment, but then a grin splits his face as he realizes what day it is. Changing into his traveling clothes, Ash doesn't even stop for breakfast, instead running up the main street of Pallet with a piece of toast sticking out of his mouth. His eyes set squarely on the one and only Oak Pokemon Labs. To the professor's surprise, the normally scatterbrained Ash is the first young trainer to arrive, and so with a smile he welcomes him inside, bidding him to choose the Pokemon who will be his lifelong partner. Ash does not need to stop and think about this, having spent many hours contemplating this decision, and so proudly announces that he wants Squirtle. Oak calls this a fine choice, and so hands Ash Squirtle's ball, along with a Pokédex and five empty Pokéballs. Ash thanks the old man, then wastes no time bringing out his Squirtle, blinking as if not used to this light, Squirtle looks up at Ash as the boy introduces himself and asks if it wants to come with him. Squirtle nods eagerly at this offer, then blows a rather large bubble roughly the size of its head, passing it to Ash and in turn having it thrown back in a game of catch. Ash and Squirtle maintain this game for several minutes, building not only a playful friendship but also a sense of coordination as they quickly get a feel for the way the other moves and works in their attempt to keep the bubble from hitting the floor and bursting. Eventually though, this game must end, and as it does, Ash eagerly tells his new friend that it's time they get going as they have a whole wide world to explore and a journey to begin. Meanwhile, not too far away in another pallet town home, a different boy is rising from his slumber. Unlike Ash, there is no urgency to his movements as he sashays into the dining room where half a dozen delicious breakfast foods are waiting for him. Eating at his leisure, this boy then meanders back upstairs to shower and pick an outfit he feels will most impress the people of pallet town for his trainer debut. From downstairs, his mother calls out, suggesting that he really should be getting to the lab. But with a confident scoff, the youth retorts there's no rush, knowing Gramps he's already set aside the best Pokemon for him. After all, he's Gary Oak. When he is good and ready, Gary saunters down to the lab, where a crowd is formed to see him off. His maternal grandfather, the mayor, has even provided him with a convertible, a chauffeur, and a group of cheerleaders. Not that he deserves any less as a future Pokemon master. So all there's left to do now is collect his Pokemon and be on his way. Swanning into the lab, Gary greets his Gramps Professor Oak, telling him to point him towards the starters, and with a nod, the old man gestures to a machine where three Pokeballs rest. Having no doubt in his mind, Gary reaches immediately for Squirtle's ball, declaring that he chooses it only for the ball to spring open revealing nothing. Nodding gravely, Oak tells his grandson that this Pokemon was already chosen by someone who was on time, causing Gary to scowl that he thought Gramps knew to put that one aside for him. But no matter, he can make do with Charmander. Grabbing the fire type's ball, he is shocked to have the same thing happen as with Squirtles, and wasting no time, the younger Oak snatches up Bulbasaur's ball, only to be met by failure once again, as his grandfather quips that the early bird gets the worm, or in this case, the Pokemon. Petulantly, Gary demands to know how his Gramps could have let this happen to him, but with a reassuring tone, Oak explains that he does have one more Pokemon left. It's a bit more volatile than the rest, so he didn't want to offer it to any of the other new trainers, but for a smart young man like Gary, he's confident the pair can develop a deep and meaningful bond. Knowing at this confirmation of his own greatness, Gary tells his Gramps to let him have it, and with the press of a button, a fourth Pokeball bearing a lightning bolt on it appears in the center of the machine. Taking hold of it, Gary tells the Pokemon inside to come on out, and in a flash of light, his new partner appears, taking shape as a small electric rodent. Being the grandson of the region's professor, Gary already knows what this is, and so greets Pikachu with a grin, introducing himself and saying the two of them are going to go on an adventure. However, Pikachu seems wholly disinterested, turning his head away from Gary in a very 
clear snub. Trying to mask his scowl, Gary tells Pikachu that it'll be fun. Though when the electric mouse still does not acknowledge him, the young oak tells his gramps that he thinks this one's a dud. This at last gets Pikachu's attention, with the temperamental electrotype using Thundershock to electrocute his new trainer, and Professor Oak who is standing nearby. When he is done, he gives the boy a contemptuous look, as if asking if he still thinks he's a dud. Though now Gary's entire demeanor has changed, as he grins with power like that, he'll become a Pokemon master in no time at all. Sagely, Oak reminds his grandson that there's more to being a Pokemon master than just power, but Gary doesn't want to hear it, telling Pikachu to come on, since the car's waiting and he wants to hit up the Viridian Gym before nightfall. To the boy's chagrin, Pikachu meets this declaration with the same enthusiasm as all of Gary's other ones. That is to say, none, as he flops down on the machine and begins scratching himself behind the ear, almost mockingly, as if he is telling Gary that he has no intention of listening to him or following his schedule. By now the scowl is definitely on Gary's face, as he's unused to anyone refusing him, and so grumbling that he doesn't have time for this, the boy points Pikachu's Pokeball at him and commands him to return. At once a beam of red light shoots out to encompass the electric rodent, and as it does, Gary spots a change in Pikachu's expression. Instead of anger or loathing, it's something much harder to recognize. Figuring that's a problem for later, Gary bids his gramps goodbye, then after receiving his Pokedex and Pokeballs, returns to his adoring public, bombastically thanking them for coming out, and promising to make the town of Pallet known around the world when he becomes a Pokemon master. This causes the assembled crowd to erupt in cheers as Pallet's golden boy hops in the back of his convertible and is driven away while cheerleaders chant his name enthusiastically. This trip by car is a brief one, as by following the road, Gary is able to reach Viridian City in half an hour, a thought which amuses him as he imagines Ashy Boy and those other two scrubs who starred before him still trying to get through Route 1 on foot. As they say, it's better to work smarter not harder, and no one's smarter than Gary Oak. Laughing to himself, Gary gets to work heading straight for Route 22, since he's heard one of his Gramps' favourite rare Pokemon lives there, and if he's going to make his first capture, it might as well be something more impressive than a standard Pidgey or Rattata. Thanks to actually knowing about Pokemon, Gary is quickly able to locate exactly the one he wants, making his way to the place where its natural food source can be found, then following the freshest tracks. This leads him directly to a pack of Nidoran and spotting what appears to be the alpha male, he brings out Pikachu. From the look on the rat's face, he is none too happy to see his trainer, though there is no time for foul feelings, as upon spotting this little yellow interloper, the Nidoran leader has gone into a frenzy, rushing at Pikachu with horn attack. Not wanting to fight for Gary, Pikachu's first instinct is to run, but this only results in him being cornered by the rest of the pack. Seeing that he has no choice, Pikachu lets out a thundershock, and thanks to all his latent power, this is enough to take out the whole pack, including the alpha. Grinning, Gary thanks the electric rodent for the assist, before lobbing a pair of Pokeballs, catching both the Alpha Nidoran as well as one of the females for good measure. With this out of the way, it is a piece of cake to start catching the other Pokemon who live on the route, as unlike Pikachu, his pair of Nidoran are perfectly obedient, with him soon adding a Spearow and a Pidgey to his roster. By now it is mid-afternoon, and so after stopping off at the Pokemon Center to get his team healed up, Gary heads for the Viridian Gym, confident in his ability to win his first badge. However, upon reaching the gym, he is stopped by a pair of men in Centurion outfits, who declare that the Viridian Gym is closed, with the leader being away on business. Though even if he wasn't, he doesn't have time to waste on beginner trainers. Angrily, Gary asks if these Bucketheads know who he is, but this just makes the Centurions laugh as they tell him to scram or else. Fuming, Gary is forced to return to the Pokemon Center empty-handed. Though refusing to lose his momentum, he uses this time to read up on the next closest gym. Thankfully, there is a Rock-type one in Pewter City, as well as a Water Gym just after. These should be easily manageable for his Pokemon, and so with his sights now set on Pewter, he heads off again. Unlike the trip to Viridian, this is one Gary will have to make on foot, as convertibles, while stylish, are not incredibly well equipped for traversing forests. To this end, he also sends his cheerleaders home, saying he'll meet them in Cerulean City, since this leg of his journey will be easier to undertake solo. Setting off into Viridian Forest on his own, Gary wastes no time in catching himself a Weedle and a Caterpie, with him sending Weedle back to his grabs for safekeeping. On top of this, he also begins to work on his primary goal while here in the forest, teaching his male Nidoran Double Kick, since that will surely be more than enough to overcome Brock. Wanting to reach this goal as quickly as possible, he has Nidoran battle every wild Pokemon they come across, with little poison type quickly proving himself an eager and aggressive battler. Unlike Pikachu, who on the few occasions Gary brings him out, is as uncooperative and hard-headed as ever. 
When night falls and the Pokemon of the forest hunker down to sleep, Gary still does not stop, having need around training against the other members of his team. With this yielding noticeable returns, both for the Poison Pin Pokemon and his training partners, even Pikachu participates in this, if only because it means he is able to battle against Gary as payback for repeatedly sticking him in his ball when he is not battling. However, to the mouse's surprise, after only a few hours of training with Gary, Nidoran has already caught up to his level, as where once a single Thundershock could take the Poison type out, now he can tank a few and even deal some serious damage back in return. The following morning after a good night's sleep, Gary experiences another milestone, his very first trainer battle, when a lunatic and samurai cosplay leaps out at him with a katana. At first Gary isn't quite sure how to take this, though after the boy explains his name is Samurai and he wishes to battle, Gary's tune changes entirely. Squaring off, the pair agree to a 2v2, though this is hardly necessary as when Samurai chooses Metapod, Gary has Nidoran take the prone pupa out with a single horn attack. Following this, Samurai brings out his heavy hitter and pincer, and while it does not go down quite as easily as Metapod, when it grabs hold of Nidoran with its barbed horns, this is just the impetus the poison pin Pokemon needs to master double kick, using the first kick to force the painful vice apart, and the second to strike the top of Pincer's head, ending the battle. Recalling Nidoran with acknowledgement of a job well done, Gary turns to leave, though before he can get far he is stopped by Samurai, who demands he take him on as a student. Not sure if he could put up with the other boy's intensity for any extended period of time, Gary declines, telling the swordsman that he's really not the teacher type. Hanging his head, Samurai requests that Gary at least tell him where he learned to be so strong, with the brunette replying that most of what he knows he learned from his gramps, Professor Oak. This perks Samurai back up, as he roars that of course, it's only naturally lost to the scion of the proud house of Oak, before asking if there are any more of his kin that he might battle. Not entirely sure what Samurai means, Gary shrugs that there should be three other trainers from Pallet Town coming by soon if he wishes to challenge them, and offer the excitable boy is happy to accept. Speaking of excitable and Pallet Town trainers, we pick back up with Ash, as he finally reaches Viridian City. Thanks to having an obedient starter, he was able to catch himself a Pidgey with Squirtle's help, and so continued on at a reasonable pace, hunkering down when a nasty storm hit and resuming in the morning. Wanting to get his two Pokemon checked out, he stops off at the Pokemon Center, though when he arrives, he finds the place cordoned off with police tape, soon learning from an Officer Jenny that the center was robbed last night by a group of thieves calling themselves Team Rocket. This deeply upsets the young man, imagining how the poor kidnapped Pokemon must be feeling, but with nothing he can do to help, he continues on into Viridian forest, eager to make some new Pokemon friends. As this happens, Gary is making his way out of the forest, finally feeling as though Nidoran is ready to take on the gym. After stopping off at the Pewter Pokemon Center, he promptly heads to the only building in town made out of giant rocky slabs, which unsurprisingly turns out to be his target. Stepping inside, Gary declares his intent to challenge, causing the gym leader's platform to become illuminated, as a young man with spiky hair states that he is Brock the gym leader, and that he will grant the boy's request for a battle. As a rocky battlefield appears in the middle of the room, Brock then states that their match will be a two on two, though with a cocky grin, Gary declares he only needs one Pokemon, bringing out his Nidoran, as Brock chooses Geodude. As planned, Nidoran goes straight for a double kick, with both blows connecting, though to Gary's surprise this is not enough to down the rock Pokemon, as Brock lightly admonishes that there's more to Pokemon battling than just type matchups. It's also about the bonds of partnership, with his and Geodudes being strong and long standing enough that they won't crumble at the first sign of a fighting type move. To prove this point, he has Geodude use tackle, with the boulder's shoulder charge knocking Nidoran off his feet. Squeaking with pain, the poison pin Pokemon lands on his side, while Brock suggests that maybe Gary ought to do a bit more training before challenging him again. However, Gary will not hear of it, ordering Nidoran to get up, with the rabbit dutifully clambering back to his feet. Praising the determination, Brock has his old friend use tackle again, but this time Gary is ready, having Nidoran jump over Geodude and use double kick from behind so that when the two kicks land, their force works with Geodude's momentum rather than against it, causing the rock type to lurch forward faster than expected and crash headlong into the gym wall before it can change course. This leaves it open to one last double kick, and never one to pass up an easy victory, Gary has Nidoran pounce on Geodude and end things there. Brock's second Pokemon is none other than his Onyx, with the Rock Leviathan roaring fiercely as it takes to the field. However, instead of being cowed, Nidoran attempts to return the favor, screaming right back at Onyx in an attempt to assert dominance. This is dreadfully ineffective though, as while Onyx is a massive serpent made of rocks, large and heavy enough to crush a car, Nidoran is a one foot tall purple rabbit, with at least half of that height being his ears. Nonetheless, the poison pin Pokemon stands firm, glaring dags at Onyx until Gary has him attack. Rushing in, Nidoran attempts to use Double Kick to bring this battle to a swift conclusion, though surprisingly Onyx is faster, bringing its massive tail down to swat the little quadruped away before he can even make it halfway across the field. Letting out a squeal of pain, Nidoran flops to the floor once again, though it seems this time he has left his opponent with a parting gift, as when Onyx next outside a bellow, it is one of pain. 
with Brock quickly surmising that his rock serpent has been poisoned thanks to coming into contact with Nidoran's horn. Recognising that time is no longer on their side, Brock tells Onyx to wrap things up with rap, causing Nidoran to be scooped up as the stones of Onyx's tail constrict around him. Letting out another pain squeal, the tiny poison type fights tooth and nail to free himself from his prison. Though against such a large and powerful Pokemon, this is just as ineffectual as his intimidation tactics. Knowing that Nidoran can't hold on much longer and that no one else in his team stands a chance against Onyx, Gary resorts to a desperate play, telling Nidoran to use Double Kick on himself. Squeaking his understanding, Nidoran slams his feet into each other, with the force of this self-inflicted Double Kick being enough to send him shooting out of Onyx's grasp like a cork from a champagne bottle. Flying upwards in a parabola, Nidoran attempts to repeat the trick when he lands on one of Onyx's boulders, except instead of kicking off his own feet, he kicks off Onyx, allowing him to keep bouncing while dealing super effective damage to the Rock Snake. By continuing this, Nidoran is able to climb Onyx's serpentine body until he finally reaches the Rock type's head, at which point he delivers a two-footed kick between the eyes that sends the behemoth crashing to Earth. Landing in front of it, Nidoran, like his trainer, knows that one more good hit should end things. Though as the poison snake groans weakly, a group of high-pitched voices speak up, pleading with Gary not to hurt Onyx. Looking into the shadowy recesses of the gym, Gary spots a group of children, all of whom share a resemblance to Brock, and as he meets their eyes, they all cry once more that Onyx is their big bro's best friend, so they can't stand to see it lose. Unfortunately for them, Gary is unmoved by such appeals to emotion, flicking his hair and cockily grinning that sometimes losing comes with the territory of being a gym leader, and they can't can't blame him just because his Pokemon's stronger. He then calls for one last double kick, and as the Poison Pin Pokemon slams his feet into the Rock type's face, Onyx faints, ending the match in Gary's favour. Unlike his siblings, Brock has no recrimination for the young challenger as he approaches him, handing him the boulder badge and congratulating him on his win. Still with that self-satisfied smirk on his face, Gary tells the gym leader not to take his loss too hard, since he's the grandson of Professor Oak and a future Pokemon master to boot. Then with a perfunctory smell you later, he departs, with Nidoran by his side. Following another visit to the Pokemon Center, Gary gets back on the road, and though it takes him several more days to reach Mount Moon, he does not waste this time, battling every trainer he meets and growing stronger as a result. During this time, Gary's Caterpie evolves into a Metapod and then a Butterfree soon after, while Nidoran proves himself to be the unequivocal ace of the team. This latter fact troubles Pikachu, as in such a short span of time he has gone from being stronger than the Poison type to his inferior, having barely grown at all since leaving Pallet Town. Wanting to correct this, he begins to work harder in his training, even going along with Gary's instructions I'll be it begrudgingly. In turn, Gary begins to use Pikachu more in battle, as well as giving him praise and other forms of positive reinforcement, such as allowing him to walk alongside him once he realizes how much the Electric Mouse hates his Pokeball. As a result, Trainer and Star do begin to form something of a bond, as they are both stubborn, innately talented, and driven to be the very best. To this end, by the time they reach the end of Route 3 and the entrance to Mount Moon, Pikachu is once more able to stand shoulder to shoulder with Nidoran at the forefront of the team. Meanwhile, Ash has finally made his way out of Viridian Forest, having defeated Samurai with Squirtle's hard shell proving too much for Pince's horns. He has also caught himself a Weedle, which has evolved into a Kakuna, though neither it nor Pidgey are needed for his upcoming gym battle, as with its quite effective water typing, Squirtle's bubble attack is more than enough to make short work of both Onyx and Geodude. This means Ash is victorious on his first attempt, though more importantly, without his time training Ash, Flint never feels compelled to fulfill his responsibilities as a father and the true pewter gym leader, meaning Brock remains at the gym while Ash journeys onwards alone. Back with Gary as he finally makes his way into Mount Moon, he is accosted by none other than Seymour the Scientist, with the bespectacled young man being all a Twitter thanks to the recent addition of lights by some unknown group disturbing the Pokemon native to the mountain. Spotting Pikachu by Gary's side, Seymour implores him as a trainer to help, with Gary agreeing under the proviso that Seymour help him get his hands on one of the rare moonstones said to be found here, so that he can eventually evolve his Nidoran after he becomes a Nidorino. As it turns out, the source of the disturbance is none other than Biff and Cassidy, as after Jesse and James' successful heist back in Viridian, they are now the bottom of the Team Rocket totem pole, with the hope being that by bringing Giovanni a giant moonstone, they can get back in his good graces. Unfortunately for them, Gary has no sympathy for such crooks, having Pikachu and Nidoran team up against their Raticate and Primate, with the villainous squad being sent blasting off again as their lights are also destroyed. In the aftermath of this battle, the only light is Nidoran's glowing body as he at last evolves into Nidorino, while all around him the Clefairy begin to return. Following the Jolly Pink sprites, Gary and Seymour bear witness their evolutionary ceremony as several of them approach fragments of the giant moonstone and are transformed into Clefable. Smiling, Seymour tells Gary that he can collect his reward now if he wants, but with a cool shake of his head, the young brunette replies that it looks like it means a lot to the Clefairy, so he'll find another somewhere else. Touched by this, Seymour informs Gary that he has a sample of moonstone back at Celadon University which the boy can have, with the Pallet Town native promising to take him up on the offer when he finally passes through Celadon. Following this, it is only a short walk to the end of the cave, with Gary stopping only briefly to catch himself a Zubat and a Geodude. Next up 
his Route 4, with it taking him several more days to get through here, though as he goes he makes sure to add a few more Pokemon to his ever-growing team, as well as working with Nidorino to get him used to his new larger body. He even finds time to write a little message for Ash on the route marker indicating Cerulean City is nearby, then with no further business, he continues on to Cerulean. Now that he is finally here, Gary's first order of business is to check into the Pokemon Center, not only so he can make sure his Pokemon are okay, but also so he can reunite with his cheerleaders, who have been eagerly awaiting his arrival. As expected, they greet him with an exuberant cheer, which only further inflates his ego, as he declares that they're going to head straight for the Cerulean Gym and win him his second badge. The cheering squad also fangirl over Pikachu when they finally get to see him up close without threat of being electrocuted, and having taken on some of his trainer's qualities, Pikachu can't help but enjoy the adulation. Eventually, Nurse Joy clears Gary's team, and without a moment to spare, he and his friends make a beeline for the gym. Here they are met by a trio of young women who call themselves the Sensational Sisters, and having not yet been disheartened by the other Pallet Town trainers, they accept his challenge, with their gym battle being a simple 1v1 against Daisy. Having already read that this place is a water gym, Gary has no trouble with his pick, calling for Pikachu, while Daisy chooses Seal. The battlefield is a long pool with several floating platforms, and as the little electric rodent leaps onto one of them, he is met by a cheer of Pikachu, Pikachu, we believe in you, Pikachu, Pikachu, we believe in you, a fact which only bolsters his confidence as the call is given for the battle to begin. Slipping into the water, Seal stares at his opponent. While brimming with confidence, Daisy declares that her Pokemon is a top-class water performer, whose grace and elegance make it unmatched in, though before she can finish, Gary has Pikachu electrocute the water, dealing massive damage to the Sea Lion Pokemon, who floats to the surface looking dazed. This prompts another chorus from the cheerleaders, praising Gary this time, and looking a little flustered, Daisy snaps at her sisters to come up with a cheer for her. Wrecking their brains, Lily and Violet half-heartedly begin one, though quickly give up, claiming that Rhyme is, like, totally hard. Unfortunately for Daisy, while this has been going on, things have gone from bad to worse for Seal, as when she attempts to have the water type use headbutt, Pikachu simply dodges, using his vaunted speed to leap from platform to platform before coming back for a quick attack of his own. This knocks Seal into the water, and before Daisy can do anything else, Gary has Pikachu use Thundershock on the water once more, taking Seal out and ending the match almost as soon as it began. Swanning over to the sisters, Gary mocks that this was the easiest battle he's ever had, claiming that he's battled youngsters with a Rattata who gave him more of a challenge than them. Pouting, Daisy states that maybe she won't give him the badge then, but being the most level-headed of the three, Lily says that isn't an option, handing Gary the Cascade badge he is owed, though with a look of distinct dislike. Seeing as how Pikachu took no damage in the fight, there is no need to return to the Pokemon Center, with Gary and his gang instead taking off towards Vermilion City in the convertible. As a result of this speedier and more direct method of travel, Gary does not come across the hidden village Damien or the Squirtle Squad, though he does stop in a town being terrorized by the Tiny Turtles to buy himself a snack from the general store. Eventually, however, Gary does reach Vermilion City, where he finds the gym leader to be none other than an Electric-type specialist, said to use a Raichu of incredible power. The idea of such a challenge excites Pikachu, and though Gary is a little hesitant to enter at what he perceives to be a disadvantage, he also knows that Pikachu is as stubborn as he is, so there's no point arguing with the rat. Heading into the gym, Gary and his chillid is met by a mountain of a man who introduces himself as Lieutenant Surge. He also fawns over the girls, going in for a group hug, though moving as one, the cheer squad all step back, causing the big man to fall on his face. Clearing his throat, Gary points out that he is actually the challenger here, with Surge dusting himself off and taunting that what he is is a baby. Unlike Ash, Gary is not troubled by this put-down, telling Surge you can call him whatever he wants, since he's got a name for the lieutenant too, the guy he's about to beat for his third gym badge. Unfortunately for Gary, Bravado is no substitute for power, and after foregoing many training opportunities by travelling here in his car, Gary and Pikachu lack the strength to stand up to Raichu, with the battle going about as badly as in canon, with Pikachu being hospitalised as a result. Also like in canon, Gary is left with a choice when Nurse Joy presents him with a Thunderstone, pointing out that Pikachu could become a Raichu just like Surge's if he uses this. Looking between the stone and Pikachu's battered body, Gary weighs his options, then as he takes a seat beside his starter's bed, he makes his choice. We pick back up with Ash just as he is leaving Cerulean City. After a somewhat arduous trek, our young hero finally made it to the city, though to his dismay, when he arrived at the gym, he was met with a trio of listless leaders, none of whom had any interest in battling him after their recent string of losses. As a result, he was simply given a Cascade Badge in the hope that he would go away, and with no other real option, the young man did as he was bid, feeling highly dissatisfied with the encounter. Now though he is back on the open road, and the prospect of adventure with Squirtle and his other friends by his side fills him with hope. Unfortunately, 
Joy, due to the absence of two particular friends, those being Brock and Misty, this next leg of Ash's journey is no easier than the previous one, as without their guidance, he quickly finds himself lost and desperately short on food. Thankfully, even if his sense of direction is lacklustre, the same cannot be said for Ash's sense of smell, with him quickly catching wind of some delicious cooking in the distance and following it to a small cabin by a secluded lake. Pokemon play merrily around the lake, though when they catch sight of the human, they all scatter, aside from a highly aggressive Bulbasaur who barrels directly towards the boy in an attempt to drive him away. Bringing out Squirtle, Ash prepares to battle, though before he can even call his first move, another voice rings out, that of Melanie as she forbids any fighting here. Respecting this, Bulbasaur comes to a stop, while Ash in turn calls his buddy back to him, patting it on the head and thanking it for having his back. He then addresses Melanie, apologising for causing trouble, and explains how he's lost and followed his nose here. With a chuckle, the blue-haired woman says that it's quite alright, inviting him inside for some food and explaining this place is a sanctuary for injured and abandoned Pokemon. This only makes Ash feel more guilty for jumping into a fight, but all the same he expresses admiration for Melanie's goal, as well as Bulbasaur's dedication to protect the other Pokemon. With an air of melancholy, the village matron agrees that Bulbasaur is a great defender, though she fears that if it stays here, it will never be able to live up to its full potential. Truthfully, she'd like nothing more than for it to go out into the world with a kind trainer like Ash, though at her feet, the seed Pokemon gives an annoyed little grunt, as if questioning just how kind Ash really is. Fortunately, Ash has plenty of chances to answer that question over the next few days, as after discovering how ill-equipped he is to travel on his own, Melanie's empathetic nature prevents her from sending him on his way until she's helped him to become more self-sufficient. She does this by teaching him all she's learned from living out in nature, such as how to identify edible plants, how to clean and dress minor injuries, and how to use the sun and stars to make sure he never gets lost again. During this time, his Pokemon get to know the residents of the hidden village, with Ash's shy Kakuna finally feeling comfortable enough to emerge from its pupil state as a Beedrill, while Pidgey and Squirtle recount the stories of their time with Ash, slowly allowing the traumatized Pokemon to trust him. Though Bulbasaur remains suspicious, even it cannot deny Ash's good intentions when during the third day of the boy's stay, the hidden village receives a pair of new guests, Munch and Cassidy. After the fiasco at Mount Moon, the pair of thieves need a win badly, and luckily for them, one of Dr. Namba's drones discovered this undefended little hideaway, so now all they gotta do is swipe the Pokemon, right? Wrong. As after all Melanie has done for him, Ash isn't about to allow these poor Pokemon to be stolen like the ones in Viridian. Teaming up with Bulbasaur, he quickly sends the pair blasting off, and in doing so earns the grass type's trust. So much so that a few hours later when Ash prepares to depart, with a small bag of Melanie's trial mix for the road, he is stopped by Bulbasaur who demands a battle. Smiling, Melanie explains that this is Bulbasaur's way of testing to see if it should go with him, and eager for the chance to have the spunky toad as a companion, Ash calls forth Squirtle to finish what they started when they arrived. Even with a tight disadvantage, Squirtle proves more than a match for Bulbasaur, using its hard shot to protect itself from the worst of the grass types raised leaves and vine whips, as it closes in and uses tackle to knock Bulbasaur off its feet. Due to this being a friendly match, Bulbasaur accepts defeat here, having been sufficiently impressed by the strength of Ash and Squirtle's bond, and so when the boy throws a Pokeball, the seed Pokemon puts up no resistance, allowing itself to be caught. After this comes the encounter with Damien and Charmander, but here not much changes from canon, as Ash still saves Charmander from the rain, though with no Jesse and James to dig a pit trap, Ash is able to follow after it when Charmander goes back to its rock in the morning to wait for Damien. Knowing that the little lizard truly won't budge without the disloyal scumbag say so, Ash and his Pokemon decide to sit with Charmander and try to convince it to come with them. Among Ash's Pokemon, Bulbasaur is the most vocal, using its innate gift for mediation to try and form a compromise, as though it knows that Damien will never come back, it is also plain to see that Charmander values its loyalty over its own life. To this end, Bulbasaur suggests that Charmander come with them at least until they meet Damien again, since if they're on the move, they'll have a better chance of running into him, with the assurance that Ash will not stop it if it chooses to return to its old trainer at that point. Like Bulbasaur itself was, Charmander is hesitant, remembering Damien's instruction to wait on this rock, though having seen the type of person Ash is, the little lizard does eventually deem this offer acceptable, allowing Ash to catch it and growing the young man's team to five as he sets off once again. Finally, there is the encounter with the Squirtle Squad. Like in canon, this begins when Ash finds himself at the bottom of one of their pit traps, though this time when the tiny turtles come to jeer at him, Ash's own Squirtle bursts from its ball to lecture them right back. This intrigues the leader Squirtle, who suggests that maybe Ash's Squirtle should ditch this loser and join their gang, since it's way more fun. But with a stern scowl, Ash's Squirtle retorts that this boy is his friend and partner, so he'll never abandon him. It then punctuates this thought with a water gun, which strikes the leader in the face, causing it to tumble back onto its shell and flail help Helplessly. By now Ash and Squirtle have made their way out of the pit, and as the rest of the Squirtle squad help their boss back to its feet, it barks angrily at its human-trained counterpart that it will pay for making it look bad in front of the crew. 
the leader Squirtle then challenges Ashes to a battle, declaring that if it loses it has to leave its precious trainer and join the Squirtle squad. Scoffing, Ashes Squirtle snaps back that it's not going to do that, since there's nothing in it for it. But this just results in the entire squad erupting in mocking laughter, as they sneer that it's scared, and that it knows it can't win, since it was trained by such a loser. Despite its generally stoic demeanour, one trait Ash's Squirtle has inherited from him is his temper, and upon hearing this slight against its best friend, Squirtle rounds on the squad, snarling that fine, it'll give the leader its wish. It then looks up at Ash, and though the boy does not speak the language of Pokemon, he understands a challenge when he sees one, taking his place behind Squirtle and giving his opening command. What follows is a brief battle, as while the Squirtle squad leader is gutsy, Ash shares its trainer's determination, going so far as to evolve in order to win this battle. Once this has happened, the match is as good as over, with the five members of the squad all taking a knee in front of Wartortle and accepting their loss. Looking up at Wartortle, the leader offers it its sunglasses, stating that since it won, it is now their boss. Though with a shake of its head, Wartortle replies that it doesn't want either its glasses or its job. All it wants is for the Squirtle squad to stop harassing travellers. Nodding, the leader replies that this is something they can do. Then as it rises back to its feet, it shakes hands with Wartortle. Not long after this, the boss's Oku Turtles depart, vowing to turn over a new leaf like the boss wanted, and though Wartortle does sigh a little at the forced sobriquet, it doesn't press the issue, instead turning back to Ash, who is delighted that his starter has evolved. Toddling over to its trainer, the turtle Pokemon allows itself to be wrapped in a hug, then together, the pair set off as well, eager to see what adventures await them just over the horizon. Back in Vermilion City, Gary sits across from Pikachu, his decision weighing heavier on him than the Thunderstone in his palm. From his hospital bed, Pikachu watches his trainer questioningly, his eyes flicking from Gary's face to the Thunderstone in his hands, and when Gary sees this, he speaks up, seeing no point in delaying any further. Looking Pikachu in the eye, he begins to tell him that he doesn't blame the mouse for their loss to Surge today, since what cost them the win wasn't a lack of skill, but a lack of power. Simply put, Raichu are stronger than Pikachu, so this outcome was inevitable. The only question is what they're going to do about it. While they could train night and day to overcome Raichu's natural advantage, the amount of effort they'd have to put in for the gain would not be worth it in his opinion, not when another option is available to them. He then lays the Thunderstone on Pikachu's bed, near enough that he can reach it, but far enough that it will not accidentally trigger the evolution, as he says that he believes evolution is their best course of action. By doing so, Pikachu will immediately be boosted to Raichu's level, maybe even higher due to his incredible latent potential. But not only that, he will also be able to make the most of his abilities once he is in his final form, as he will finally have a body that can handle his full potential. However, Gary is also aware that this is a life-altering and permanent change, so he will not force it on Pikachu if the Electric type does not want it. Understandably, this is all a lot for Pikachu to take in at once, and as the Electric Rodent's eyes fall on the stone, he weighs his options. On one hand, to evolve now would be to admit his inferiority to a Raichu, but on the other, it's like Gary said, right now he's not able to harness his full potential, meaning he has an unfair handicap. Evolving would remove that handicap, turning the rematch with Raichu into a proper test of his abilities. On top of that, it would also secure his position at the forefront of the team, as while he has kept pace with Nidorino since Mount Moon, he knows the rabbit has another evolution, so to refuse his own would be to accept falling behind once again, something he desperately does not want thanks to the pride his time with Gary has given him. At this point, Pikachu's mind is pretty much made up, and as he rises to his feet, it is with a look of determination in his eyes. Then, without hesitation, he reaches out and lays a paw on the Thunderstone. The change is almost instantaneous, as in a flash of white light, Pikachu is transformed into a powerful-looking Raichu, and as Gary meets the orange newcomer's eyes, Raichu's cheeks flash eagerly, telling the youth that he has chosen his path so now it is time they walk it together. Thanks to this evolution, all of Raichu's injuries from the last battle are gone, with the Electric Rodent being full of energy, rather literally in fact, as his Electric Battery is fully recharged, meaning all that's left to do now is return to the gym and see if this decision Gary and Raichu has made is the right one. When the pair re-enter the gym, Surge is surprised to see them back so soon, though all the same he agrees to a rematch when he sees that Gary took his advice and evolved that pipsqueak Pikachu into something with real power. However, he quickly comes to rude that piece of guidance when the battle begins, as like Gary predicted, Evolution has given Raichu access to all of his power without the limiters of a smaller, weaker body. Putting this to use, Gary's Raichu makes short work of Surge's, while also turning the gym into a site of ruination, the likes of which Gary has never seen. Even Surge is shocked, commenting that he hasn't seen a Pokemon cause that much destruction since the war, and counselling Gary to work with his partner on controlling that output, so they don't go overboard. Scoffing, Gary calls this a bit rich coming from the guy who put his starter and countless other Pokemon in the hospital, but all the same, he approaches the big man and takes his badge, telling Raichu to come on, since they've got places to be. Where those places are, however, even Gary doesn't know, as with Vermillion being a nexus both by land and sea, the choice of where to go next is a tricky one. 
heading down to the harbour to see if there are any ships heading to a city with a gym, he soon comes across a pair of schoolgirls who tell him about an exclusive Pokemon trainer party on the St. Anne cruise liner, which will be travelling all around Kanto's southern islands, meaning he'll have plenty of opportunity to get his next badge while also getting a tan. The girls then give him a stack of free tickets, saying this should be enough for him and all his friends before departing in a hurry. While this is certainly odd behaviour, Gary doesn't question it, being very used to people giving him free stuff. And so a few days later when the party on the St. Anne is set to begin, he, his cheerleaders and his Pokemon board the boat for a voyage none of them are ever likely to forget. As promised, it is a swanky affair where the cream of the crop are able to meet, battle and trade at their leisure. Gary of course takes full advantage of the opportunity, having his Butterfree battle a gentleman's Raticate, and after defeating the normal type, agrees to a trade. While on the surface, trading away a winning Pokemon for a loser would seem like a bad idea, Gary knows from his gramps that traded Pokemon tend to grow faster due to having experience with multiple trainers, making this a smart decision in the long run. Unfortunately, Gary isn't able to make any other trades as not long into the trip, the serving staff and several other employees of the St. Anne reveal themselves to be members of Team Rocket, commanding the party guests to hand over all their Pokemon. At their head stands the two girls from the harbour, though now Gary sees that they are an azure-haired young man and a magenta-haired young woman with a Meowth by their side. Exultantly, the duo command their grunt underlings to seize every last Pokemon, though this is perhaps unwise, as when a very unlucky grunt lays his hands on Raichu, he receives a nasty shock that knocks him out cold. The sight of this inspires the assembled trainers, and so rallying around Gary and Raichu, they begin to fight off their Team Rocket captors. However, all thoughts of fighting are soon forgotten when a large wave begins to capsize the ship, at which point survival becomes the name of the game. Thanks to not having any remorse for his trade, Gary along with Raichu and his fan club are among the first to make it to the lifeboats, watching along with everyone else as Team Rocket makes their escape, and the Saint Anne begins its final voyage to the bottom of the ocean. Meanwhile, Ash has just arrived in Vermilion City, and with his trademark brand of gung-ho determination, he heads straight for the gym. Even when Surge reveals that his partner is a Raichu, Ash approaches this gym battle just like his last one, by putting all his faith in Wartortle and its new evolution to carry him through. Unfortunately in this case, faith cannot trump type matchups, with the turtle Pokemon going down as easily as Surge's Raichu did to Gary's. However, even in the face of loss, Ash is not discouraged, as if he has learned anything during his trip from Cerulean, it's how to be resilient and keep moving forward no no matter what gets thrown at him. To this end, he starts working with Wartortle to get stronger, and though he is not yet aware of the concept of battle training in the same way Gary is, he quickly develops his own methods, such as running from one end of the harbour to the other in order to build up speed and endurance, or playing that bubble bounce game from the day they first met, and attempting to beat their best score as a means to improve agility and dexterity. Finally, after several days of this, the pair feel ready to take another crack at Surge, and as always, the lieutenant is eager to receive challenges. Being a brash man, Surge takes the first move, but this is exactly what Ash and Wartortle want as when the large rat attempts to belly flop the turtle into submission, War Turtle simply retreats back into its shell, injuring the hit and using the force of the impact to spin away. Thanks to their training, the water type then steers itself towards the wall, bouncing off two of them to pick up speed as it comes back and strikes Raichu with the strength of its own attack magnified by that speed. This leaves both Surge and Raichu bemused, with the former soldier deciding to vent some of this frustration in the form of a thunderbolt, knowing that even if the Kidna starter have been training, this will take him out just like it did last time. Gathering electricity in its cheeks, Raichu then lets loose a massive thunderbolt which soars right towards Wartortle, though here too Ash has a plan, having his buddy use rapid fire bubbles to create a wall which soaks up most of the damage, so that when the attack ends, Wartortle is injured, but not beaten. However, this is not the only point of the move, as when the battlers take a look at the field, they see that all the burst bubbles have created a water trail leading directly to Raichu. Flashing a confident grin, Ash then tells his partner to end this, and with a matching smile, Wartortle takes a running leap, spinning as it does, so that when it hits the water, it acts like a slip and slide, accelerating the tortoise's movement, and allowing this newly dubbed rapid spin attack to deal extra damage that strikes Raichu, taking it off its feet. Then just to add insult to injury, as the bulky rodent lands on its back, Wartortle bounces off the wall behind it, slamming into a once again and leaving it with a cartoonish lump on its head and spirals for eyes. For a moment, no one speaks. Then with a thunderous guffaw, Surge calls that one heck of an upset, congratulating Ash on his win and finally addressing him by name. Beaming, Ash thanks the lieutenant, then after wrapping his stutter in a hug, he approaches the big man to receive his badge, pinning it to his vest and vowing never to forget the lessons he learned in preparation for this rematch.
Returning to Gary, he has at last made it back to land, as thanks to the captain of the St. Anne sending out an SOS before the ship sank, the passengers and crew were not left to drift in the open ocean for long, with several nearby boats receiving the message and coming to their aid. One such vessel had been en route to the island paradise Port of Vista, with Gary and his cheerleaders deciding to hitch a ride. After the harrowing events aboard the cruise liner, the tropical wonder is exactly what they need, with the young oak and his friends taking some time to get some much needed R&R. &R. During this time, Gary runs into his gramps and Ash's mum Dilly at low local beauty contest, with him telling the pair about his recent exploits and showing them how far he and Raichu have come. The professor is delighted to see this, praising that he knew Gary and his old Pikachu would be a good fit, while Delia asks if the boys heard from Ash lately, stating that the boy hasn't called her since he left on his journey. Though Gary has no fondness for his hyperactive rival, he can see how much the absence of her son worries Mrs. Ketchum, and so promises to pass on any word he gets to her and his gramps. Though Gary had only intended to stay here a few days while waiting for a ferry back to the mainland, he quickly finds himself enjoying Port Vista so much that before he knows it, almost two weeks have passed. Thankfully, he is not the only one enjoying it. As well as Cheering Squad are having a great time, the true winners of this vacation are the Pokemon. Raticate has begun to open up to the rest of the team, finding a close friend in Raichu as a fellow rodent, and in turn Raichu seems to be having an easier time adapting to his new form now that he has someone like himself to play with. Meanwhile, ever the warrior, Nidorino seems focused on nothing but battle, venturing into rock pools and other shells in search of wild Pokemon he can test himself against. However, all good things must come to an end, and as the summer begins to draw to a close, so does Gary announce that they should really be getting back on the road. Bidding Port of Vista goodbye, Team Gary catches a ferry to Maiden's Peak, though they don't stay here long as there is little of interest, instead venturing west towards the center of Kanto's mainland. Due to having traveled by cruise ship, Gary's convertible is still back in Vermilion City, and when the boy calls his driver, she informs him that it will take her some time to rendezvous with the rest of them, meaning this next leg of the journey will have to be undertaken on foot. Though Gary has experienced traveling this way, the cheer squad aren't entirely thrilled with this development, but all the same they cheer the young charge on as he leads the way. Wanting to check the condition of his Pokemon before he reaches another gym, Gary also institutes practice battles once again, with this becoming a nightly occurrence, though it quickly becomes apparent that there is a problem with a member of his team, that being Raichu. Though Raichu has gotten used to his larger body, the same cannot be said for his larger power, with each electric attack the mouse employs dealing massive damage and leaving a path of destruction in its wake. For the first time Gary wonders if maybe Surge's Raichu hospitalizing all its opponents was not a result of sadism, but rather a lack of control over its own power. Not that it matters, as Gary has no intention of allowing his starter to be so sloppy, and so begins to work with him to learn to regulate his electrical output. Unfortunately, this is easier said than done, as in order to practice control, Raichu needs someone to test the levels against, and as it stands, none of his Pokemon can withstand a Thunderbolt from the Electric Rodent. Even Nidorino cannot stand up to the raw power of Raichu, though here at least there is a solution, as if he were to become Nido King, his newly acquired ground typing would grant him an electrical immunity, making him the perfect training partner, on top of allowing him to begin reaching his own full potential just like Raichu has. And as fortune would have it, Gary knows just how he's going to help Nidorino evolve, remembering Seymour the Scientist promised to give him a Moonstone when he made it to Celadon City. As a result, this becomes his next destination, with Gary even choosing not to pass through Saffron City, since the road he's currently on is a more direct path to Celadon. However, even the most straightforward road has detours, such as when Gary and co come across Bill and Cassidy, chasing a terrified polywag through the woods. Remembering these low lives from their prior encounter, Gary does not hesitate to step in, having his Raticate go up against Cassidy's, with his revealing that it knows Jump Kick, a move that its species does not usually learn, but which deals super effective damage to Cassidy's rat, knocking it out in a single hit. Helpfully, Steve attempts to back up his partner with Primeape, but this just gives Raichu an excuse to enter the fray and help his friend, showing off that devastating power. And with no need to hold back, he promptly sends Team Rocket blasting off again. With the battle now over, Gary and friends then proceed to get back on their way, but are stopped by Poliwag, who affectionately nuzzles the boy's legs as thanks for saving it from the bad guys. Patting its head, Gary tells the water type not to sweat it, but still the tadpole stays by his side, even following him when he begins to walk. Gary's cheerleaders all think this is adorable, with even Raichu finding the smaller Pokemon's sweet demeanor endearing. Seeing that Poliwag isn't going anywhere, Gary bends down to ask if it would like to come with him, and after receiving a big-lipped smile of confirmation, pulls out a Pokeball and adds it to his current main roster. Finally, after a couple of weeks on the road, Gary and his cheer squad arrive in Celadon City, and as expected, their first port of call is none other than the University, where Seymour is waiting for them. As promised, he is the Moonstone Fragment ready for Gary, though in his usual way, he talks the boy's ear off first, 
about all he learned during his time living with the Clefairian Clefable of Mount Moon. However, after what seems like an eternity, he does eventually hand over the stone, with Gary thanking him, then heading somewhere with a wide open enough space to accommodate Nidorino's soon to be enhanced bulk. Settling on a local park, Gary brings out his first capture, confirming with Nidorino one last time that he really wants this. Though unlike Raichu, there is no hesitation, as the Poison Pin Pokemon gives his trainer a determined look, meant to convey his readiness to take this next big step towards even greater power. Reading this loud and clear, Gary places the Moonstone on Nidorino's head, and watches as he grows into a hulking Goliath, whose fearsome appearance truly seems worthy of the title, Nido King. Getting a feel for his new body, Nido King is eager to try his hand, rather literally in fact, at a battle. And as it happens, Gary knows just the place, having spotted a gym on his way to the university. Heading over there, the boy and his companions are met by a group of young women who admit them without issue, asking how many badges Gary has, then after learning he has three, informing him that Mistress Erica is ready to battle whenever he is. Strolling confidently into the battlefield, Gary finds the place is completely covered in greenery, and it doesn't take a genius to guess what Erica's type specialty is. Thankfully, Nido King's poison typing keeps him from being weak to grass like other ground types, though all the same when the boy brings him out, Erica looks surprised, as if she had not expected a challenger to use a ground type against her of all people. All the same, when the Drill Pokemon comes stomping onto the field, Erica meets him with her Tangler, telling the writhing love crafty and enigma to use Constrict on its much larger foe. Lashing out with its vines, Tangler attempts to bind Nido King's arms in an attempt to stop him from attacking, but with the power of evolution on his side, the poisoned ground type simply yanks on his bindings, sending the much smaller Tangler soaring towards him so he can deliver a super effective Poison Sting headbutt that downs the grass type in one hit. Next up for Erica is Weepin' Bell, and this goes about as badly as it did for Tangler, as immediately Nido King stomps down twice on its opponent, squishing the sentient squash with a not very effective double kick and bringing Erica down to one. For her final Pokemon, the Grass Specialist decides to pull out all the stops, bringing forth her Vile Plume and asking it to hold nothing back. However, this would suggest it will get a chance to attack, something Nido King has no intention of giving it. As in an attempt to assert dominance, the Draw Pokemon rushes in, catching Vile Plume in a lariat and slamming it so hard into the ground that the very foundations of the gym begin to crack. Even Erica's ace Pokemon cannot withstand such brutality, and as it lies unconscious in the crater its own body is made, Nido King lets out a bellow to the heavens, declaring once and for all that he is the king. And just like that, the battle is over, with Gary's cheerleaders giving a rousing round of cheers for both Gary and Nido King as the young man returns his friend and makes his way over to Erica. Though the gym leader is a little rattled by this turn of events, she remains poised and graceful as she presents Gary with a rainbow badge, congratulating him on his victory and complimenting him on how well he has raised his Nido King. Preening a little under this praise, Gary adds the badge to his case, grinning that this is badge number four, meaning he's halfway to his goal of entering the Pokemon League. This thought then stirs another in Gary, as he remembers his promise to his Gramps and Mrs. Ketchum, and so asks if Eric has seen an idiot with wild black hair and one of those commemorative Pokemon League caps come through here lately. Smiling, Eric replies that he must mean Ash. Yes, she battled him a few days ago. Smirking, Gary asks how his rival did, though still with that smile on her face, the gym leader replies that he did quite well. In fact, she initially asked him to stick around and be a guest speaker at her next trainer class, but unfortunately, he said he couldn't afford to wait, since he was already focused on winning his sixth badge. At the word sixth, Gary almost falls off his feet, demanding to know if Erica means that Ash already has five badges. And when the grass specialist nods, confirming that hers was his fifth, Gary finds himself at a loss for words. How could he have fallen behind that loser? We return to Gary several hours after his bittersweet victory against Erica, as even now he finds himself unable to get the thought of Ashy Boy surpassing him out of his mind. Ever since they were kids, he, Gary, was the smart one, the one with natural talent and connections, and Ash was just... Ash, some loudmouth who was always chasing his back and struggling to do so at every turn. To have their roles reversed is disconcerting, but more than that, it is something Gary will not tolerate. And so he has spent the last few hours plotting a course that will not only ensure he catches up to Ash as soon as possible, but that he will also get his remaining four badges in the least amount of time, meaning there will be no chance of another nasty little surprise like this happening again. With this new roadmap in mind, the next stop for Team Gary is none other than Gringy City, as though it is not particularly populous aside from factory workers these days. It was once a thriving metropolitan area, and as a result was given a gym. While he is aware that Saffron City is equally as close, Gary chooses to eschew this option, as it would mean going in the opposite direction from his goal, since he also knows he wants the Viridian Gym to be his final stop, so he can settle the score with the people who turned him away at the start of his journey. And so it is that Gary Raichu and his squad make tracks for Gringy City, tire tracks that is, as fortunately their driver has also arrived, meaning they can make good time. Nonetheless, it does still take them a while, resulting in Gary and his team being able to get 
get some extra practice battling in. As expected, Nidoking is an ideal rival for Raichu, as he can endure all the Thunderbolts the mass Pokemon can send his way, allowing the Electric type to slowly start improving his control, though even still, Gary is unsure if anyone else could handle a zap from the feisty rat. Speaking of rats, Raticate is just as determined as ever, proving itself to be the work pony to over the team, never quite excelling to the levels of Raichu or Nidoking, but always putting in consistent effort that shows its dedication to its new trainer. However, the real shocker of the squad is none other than Poliwag, as after being too weak to save itself in the forest, it has become obsessed with evolving, believing this will give it the power it needs to look after itself. To this end, it is eager to spar with the other all-stars of Gary's team, even if they are out of its league. Wanting to encourage this ambition, Gary allows it to face off against the others, and though it does lose each and every time, it never gives up, showing itself to be the gutsiest of his Pokemon. However, this is not to say that these spars serve no beneficial purpose, as it is through one of these that Gary learns something very interesting about the tadpole. One evening after a day on the road, Gary is watching as Raichu and Poliwag square off. As usual, the Electro-type is mopping the floor with his opponent, even though he is only using his normal moves to avoid dealing serious damage to the smaller Pokemon. In spite of this handicap, Raichu's raw speed is simply too much for Poliwag to overcome, struggling to even get a hit in. That is until the rain starts falling. Knowing to catch a cold, Gary starts telling his two Pokemon to wrap it up and get into the tent. But before he can finish that sentence, something catches his attention. At that moment, Poliwag had been about to land a double slap. And though the first hit goes as normal, the second is significantly faster, the little water type becoming a blur of motion in the rain. However, this is not the only anomaly, as when Raichu goes to strike back, Poliwag easily avoids it, darting back and blasting the rodent with water gun. Gary and Raichu are both stunned by this, though it seems Poliwag is delighted, finally feeling powerful. Wanting to keep an eye on this phenomenon, Gary decides to run some tests as the rain persists over the next few days, with him soon concluding it is the rain itself which doubles Poliwag's speed. Recognizing how valuable this could be if his little tadpole can even outspeed a fully evolved electric type, Gary's next goal becomes learning how to manufacture rain, with him even calling his gramps while stopping in a nearby Pokemon Center to see if he has any insight. Always happy to help his grandson, Oak explains that as it happens, Poliwag can learn a move called Rain Dance, which will allow it to do exactly this. Eagerly, Gary asks how to teach this move to Poliwag. Though with a chuckle at the hastiness of youth, the professor explains that it will come naturally with time, adding that based on his own research, Poliwag tend to learn rain dance around the time when they are ready to become Poliwals, meaning if Gary just keeps doing what he's doing, he will succeed in the end. Thanking his gramps for the tip, Gary does exactly that, working alongside Poliwag to achieve its goal of evolution, though before they can fully commit their focus to that, Gary has a gym battle to attend to. Being in an industrial area, Gringy City's gym is unsurprisingly located inside a factory, with Gary having to wonder if the machinery and conveyor belts he sees are functional or just for show. Either way, that is of far less importance than the person who stands waiting for him at the back of the factory. A scruffy man with a floppy red cap who introduces himself as Nolan the gym leader, greeting his young challenger with a smile, and admitting it's been a while since he's been forced to do battle due to his gym falling out of popularity these last few years. Cockily, Gary taunts that he hopes Nolan isn't too rusty, though with a grin the man retorts that he and his partner are far from it, stating that his gym like this city is a well-oiled machine and it's time to prove it, calling out his Pokemon, Magneton. Weighing his options, Gary reflects that in terms of typing, his Nidoking would be the best matchup. But with his focus having been on Raichu and Poliwag, he hasn't had time to teach him a ground type move. And while Double Kick would be super effective, with Magneton's ability to fly, Nidoking would never be able to reach it with his kicks. Thankfully, he is not Gary's only skilled kicker, and so flashing a grin, he tells Raticate to come on out. Gnashing its teeth, the mass Pokemon bursts into view as the machinery of the factory whirs to life, constructing a battlefield right before their eyes. As the challenger, Gary is offered the first move. Move, and not wanting to squander this chance, he calls for a jump kick, much to the surprise of both Nolan and Magneton. This allows the rat to score a lucky hit, causing its opponent to buzz and whir in pain as the super effective fighting move takes its toll. Nodding approvingly, Nolan says that he sees now why Gary chose his Raticate, but no matter, since just like it, his Magneton is also special, possessing an ability where if it is hit, it can hit back even harder. To prove this point, Nolan has his Pokemon use Swift, and as the unerring stars strike Raticate, they are indeed quite powerful. Gritting his teeth, Gary admits that is a pretty neat trick, but that's all it is. Well, he has something better than tricks. Pure skill. Looking both amused and intrigued, Nolan welcomes the boy to show him a bit of that skill, with Gary replying that he'd be glad to, as he calls for another jump kick. However, this time Magneton is a counter, using double team to create a field of doppelgangers, forcing Gary to take a gamble on which is the real steel type. 
Unfortunately, in this case, Gary chooses wrong, and after Radicate passes through one of the fakes, it is forced to make a crash landing that inflicts damage to itself. To make matters worse, Magneton then disengages its double team, so it can use Lock On, creating a target on Radicate that cannot miss, with Nolan informing Gary that his next move will be Zap Cannon. Knowing that this is not only a powerful move, but also one that will paralyze his Radicate, Gary makes a desperate play, calling for a Hyper Fang. While Super Fang is more powerful, Hyper Fang is a trait that Gary needs, that being the chance to make Magneton flinch, and as the normal Red buries its fangs into what can only be assumed to be the steel type's face, Gary holds his breath. Then he sees it, Magneton's face screwing up in pain, and as it does, the target fades due to Magneton losing focus. This is just what Gary needs, and so wasting no time, calls for another jump kick, hoping to take out Magneton while it's vulnerable. Unfortunately, Nolan has something of a similar idea, attempting to capitalize on Radicate's close range to make up for the loss of Lock-On, as he calls for Zap Cannon. As a result, it all comes to a head here, as Radicate starts his descent just as Magneton fires the beam of electrical energy upwards, with the pair colliding in mid-air. Due to the blinding light of the Zap Cannon, Gary cannot see Radicate as he is engulfed in the beam, and so waits for the outcome of this clash, knowing that one way or the other, one of the Pokemon will not be able to battle after this. For a moment, nothing happens. Then a sound rings out through the gym, the sound of something organic impacting metal. And as Gary looks closer, he sees Radicate's foot connecting with Magneton's face, and sending it crashing into the ground. Landing as well, Radicate spasms briefly, the paralysis gained through that gambit playing havoc on its muscles, the when it sees that Magneton is unconscious, and the pride on its trainer's face for earning him this victory, Radicate no longer cares, chittering with joy as Gary pats it on the head and thanks it for its effort. Striding over to the boy in his normal type, Nolan congratulates them on their win, presenting him with the Hexnut badge, and conceding that Gary does indeed have talent. Taking the badge, Gary agrees that he sure does, though for what it's worth, Nolan made him sweat a few times there, so he's no slouch either. Laughing a little, the steel type specialist dryly replies that he's glad he has the young man's seal of approval, but all the same, he bids Gary good luck as the boy departs with his Pokemon and his fan club. Meanwhile, Ash has just arrived at the Fuchsia Gym, having had the foresight to ask Eric for directions before he left Celadon. As a result, he does not stumble blindly into the Ninja Mansion, instead entering with purpose and demanding the right to challenge. Seeing that their stealth factor is gone, the sibling duo of Koga and Aya drop down from the rafters to survey this confident young challenger with interest. Stepping inside, Ash asks the man if he is Koga, with the elder ninja confirming this, asking in turn if Ash is ready to battle. Grinning, Ash says that he always is, and so without further ado, Koga leads him to the mansion's wall garden, stating this will be their battlefield. He then brings out his Venomoth, while Ash recognizing this as a bug chooses Charmander. Like Gary did against Nolan, he gets to go first, calling for a flamethrower, which Charmander is happy to perform, belching a torrent of flame that Venomoth has to work to avoid. From his side of the field, Koga comments that Ash has trained his Charmander well, though even the best trained Pokemon cannot resist the secret arts of the ninja. To prove this point, he has Venomoth use Sleep Powder, and though Charmander tries to get away, it is already too late, with the soporific powder sending the little lizard to dreamland. Frantically, Ash urges his friend to wake up, but this is a vain effort, as Venomoth's sleep pad remains in effect, allowing the poison bug to blast its helpless target with Psybeam. Groaning in its sleep, Charmander begins to thrash, though even this pain is not enough to wake it, with it seeming as though this battle is going to end in a loss for Ash. That is until something changes in Charmander's posture, as his face goes from pain to horror, as if trapped in its worst nightmare. Then, its eyes spring open, and as it lets out a strangled roar, it begins to evolve. This is not the first time Ash has seen one of his Pokemon evolve, having seen Wartortle, Beedrill, and Pidgeotto go through the process. Though something about this evolution is different, with Charmander glowing like the sun as it ascends into its middle stage. Then, when it lets out a second roar, this time fierce and courageous, Ash welcomes Charmeleon to his team. Looking back at its trainer, Charmeleon shoots Ash a thumbs up, before glaring at Venomoth, who hisses back as if to say that it put the reptile at its mercy once and it can do it again. However, this might not be as true as Venomoth would like to believe, as when Koga calls for a Stun Spore this time, Charmeleon responds with a Flamethrower, incinerating the Stun Spore and bathing Venomoth in flames. Even a high level Pokemon such as the Gym Leader's Ace cannot withstand such an inferno, and so when Charmeleon finally drops its Fiery Assault, the Poison Bug falls to the ground, unconscious and extra crispy. Returning Venomoth with his humblest thanks, Koga then presents Ash with the Soul Badge, bringing him up to six, while at his side Charmeleon wraps Ash in a hug. Laughing fondly, Ash asks what's gotten into the lizard, but with a huff, the Fire-type simply rests its head against its trainer's side, not wanting to talk. 
Truthfully, something has changed in Charmeleon, with it having had an epiphany during the battle. Thanks to the sleep power Psybeam combo, Venomoth was unintentionally able to break through several repressive mental blocks Charmeleon had put in place by striking at its mind while in an unguarded state. This had forced the Firestar to replace some rather unpleasant memories regarding Damien, as well as face some equally ugly truths. First and foremost, that Damien had truly abandoned it like all its friends had said. Were it not for Ash, it would be dead up on that rock by now. And worst of all, Damien wouldn't have cared one bit. The only human who had ever cared about it is Ash, and now it wants to show Ash just how much it appreciates him as its trainer by carrying him all the way to the top. Returning to Gary, it has been a couple of days since his battle with Noland. Thanks to still feeling the sting of shame from having fallen behind Ash, Gary had refused to join a convoy of trainers headed to stop a Diglett infestation in favour of continuing on towards his next badge. However, he does accept one detour request, that being from his Gramps, who asked him to make a brief stop off at the Leaf Forest to investigate the strange phenomena that allows grass-type Pokemon who would normally evolve with the Leaf Stone to evolve naturally while in that forest. Being curious about this as well, Gary directs his driver to take him and the gang there, with them brief abandoning the main road in favour of a dirt track that leads them into the forest. Watching from the convertible, Gary quickly observes that the stories of this place are true, as a gloom evolves into a vile plume and a weeping bell becomes a victory bell without any apparent stimuli. However, just observing it from afar isn't much good as data, and so with Raichu by his side, Gary leaps from the car and heads deeper into the forest, determined to catch one of the evolving Pokemon. Thankfully, it does not take him long to find a viable candidate, as not too far in, Gary finds a cluster of Exeggutor camouflaging themselves as trees, calling out to Raichu for help. Gary is the electric red and zap the nearest executor, then when it falls forward, he lobs a Pokeball, catching it and sending it to his gramps for study. However, this decision comes with an unexpected cost. It seems the other executor do not appreciate this pair barging into their home and attempting to capture them, and so decide to express their displeasure in the form of a stampede. Knowing the danger this could pose, Gary and Raichu take off in the opposite direction, with Raichu only looking back to blast any executor who get too close. This works quite well, with most of them falling after one hit like the one Gary captured did. Though to both trainer and starter's surprise, there is one who manages to withstand a thunderbolt. Impressed by this power, Gary has Raichu hit it with another, though even then it does not fall, with it taking a third thunderbolt to knock the grass psychic type out. By now the stampede has petered out, as most have either given up or been knocked out, and this gives Gary just the chance he needs, as while he still wants to go, he does stop just long enough to catch this anomalous executor, though unlike its fellow, he does not send this one to his gramps, deciding to keep it around as a mainstay on his team. Over the next few days, Gary decides to test this executor's power, with him finding that physically it is a monster, being a defensive wall who can also hit like a truck when called upon. Likewise, its psychic powers are nothing to sneeze at, though here Gary finds Executor's major fault, as with his dopey personality, it takes a while to kickstart its brain and tap into its sonic potential, with the boy even wondering if the true reason Executor managed to tank three Thunderbolts is because it was too dense to realise it should be feeling pain. Nonetheless, Gary is pleased with his new catch, and when he checks in with his gramps to see how the other Executor is doing, the old man beams it as equally doing well. Having no further business to discuss with his gramps, Gary says he'll smell him later, but before he can go, Oak stops the boy, saying there's a token of appreciation for helping him with his research, he's been going over Gary's planned route, and he thinks he's found a way to cut down some time. Curiously, Gary asks what his gramps has in mind, and with a sagely smile, Oak states that instead of heading west to Matcha City, only to double back east towards Viridian, he should just keep heading south and challenge Blaine of the Cinnabar Gym. Puzzled, Gary comments that he thought the Cinnabar Gym had been closed for years, though with a chuckle, Oak replies that is what the gym leader wants people to believe, being a sly old riddle master, but in truth it is still there, waiting for someone smart enough to find it. Grinning now too, Gary says that sounds like a piece of cake for him, before hanging up in earnest, since it seems he has travel plans to adjust. However, before Gary and Co can make it to Cinnabar Island, they must first pass through Grandpa Canyon, arriving in the midst of a fossil rush. Figuring that a prehistoric Pokemon would give his team just the extra punch it needs to really make him the best, Gary decides to stick around for a little bit, figuring that surely by now he's caught up to Ashy Boy. Ironically, this proves to be more true than Gary had anticipated, as before long, he comes face to face with Ash himself, as the boy is also passing through on his way to Cinnabar. Mockingly, Gary leers that he bets Ashy Boy's lost, though with a scowl, Ash declares that he'll show him who's lost, challenging the brunette to a battle. Seeing this as a chance to truly put himself back on top where he belongs, Gary accepts, with the terms being a simple one-on-one. -on -one. In unison, the pair then call out their Pokemon, Poliwag for Gary and Charmeleon for Ash. At once, Gary can't help but smile, feeling that he has the advantage, and so jeering that he's about to give Ash a lesson in type matchups, he tells Poliwag to use Water Gun. At once, the tadpole Pokemon expels a torrent of water from its mouth, 
Though thanks to Ash having worked with it on its speed after acquiring a larger body, Charmeleon dodges, then follows up with a flamethrower that scorches the little water type. Nonetheless, Poliwag isn't about to go down so easily, running at its foe and peppering it with a series of double slaps which come in the form of kicks to the stomach. Letting out a grunt of pain, Charmeleon retreats, though refusing to lose its lead, Poliwag blasts it with water gun as it goes. Seeing the position Ash and his Charmeleon are in, Gary sneers that he knew it was a fluke his rival briefly held more badges than him, though with a fierce scowl, Ash declares it wasn't a fluke at all, it was because he and his Pokemon worked their very hardest. Sure it wasn't easy, but that just made moments like Beedrill stepping up to overcome Sabrina's Abra, or Pidgey evolving into Pidgeotto to beat Erica's Gloom all the more meaningful. By toiling side by side, he and his team have become best friends, and now there's no way they can let someone like Gary, who's never struggled in his life, beat them. This speech sets a fire in Charmeleon's eyes, and as it slashes at Poliwag, Gary almost wonders if there's some truth to Ash's words. That is until Poliwag takes the hit, then starts to glow. Suddenly, the little tadpole is not so little anymore, growing a foot in height, while also developing a pair of hands whose first actions are to deck its rival in the mouth. However, Gary is truthfully more impressed with the second action, as when Charmeleon goes staggering back, Poliwar begins to bang on its chest, causing a number of thick black rain clouds to appear overhead. A moment later the clouds burst, and as rain blankets the battlefield, Poliwar's swift swim activates, allowing it to dash forward and begin laying to Charmeleon with a flurry of blows. Against such an onslaught, the fire lizard is completely helpless, taking blows to the face and body faster than it can react. That is until Poliwar makes one fatal mistake. In an attempt to end things quickly, the tadpole Pokemon drives an uppercut to Charmeleon's chin, forcing its head up, and as it looks up at the rain pouring down on it, it cannot help but remember the night Ash saved it. That night it almost died. All at once a series of painful emotions come flooding back into Charmeleon, chief among them being blinding anger. And as the fire starter lowers its head, it is to drive a headbutt into Poliwhirl, as it begins using rage. Thanks to the power of this move, the tables swiftly turn, with Charmeleon getting in several good licks as payback for what it has endured. However, Poliwhirl is still faster, and so retaliates in kind, with the battle quickly devolving into a slug fest, as neither Pokemon uses any fancy moves anymore, instead relying on the raw power of their fists to drive the other into submission. Finally, this comes to a head when Poliwhirl manages to grab hold of Charmeleon and pile drive it into the earth, though unfortunately, the result is not one it desires, nor is it one that Charmeleon desires, as due to the ground being softened up by the rain, as well as the concussive force of these two juggernauts slamming into each other making it even more unstable, the rocks beneath the Pokemon's feet finally give way, causing Poliwhirl and Charmeleon, as well as Ash, Gary and Raichu, to plummet into the depths below. Landing hard, the pair of trainers briefly wonder where they are, though this is answered a moment later by the four sets of glowing eyes which alert them to the fact that they are not alone. Agreeing to put their feud aside for the time being in the name of survival, Ash and Gary stand shoulder to shoulder, while their Pokemon do likewise, firing off a series of fire, water and electrical attacks at the approaching fossils. While these are effective at driving away the Pokemon they can see, these attacks, like many things our heroes have done today, have unexpected consequences. In this case, the awakening of a fearsome Aerodactyl. Letting out a terrifying roar, the fossil Pokemon then swoops the group, grabbing Ash and its talons and attempting to make a break for the hole their arrival has created. Knowing they don't have any other way out, Gary commands Raichu, Poliwhirl and Charmeleon to grab on, with the four of them all taking hold of Aerodactyl's tail and not letting go until they are back on the surface. Worriedly, Gary's cheerleaders ask if he's okay, but looking confident, Gary says he's fine. In fact, he's better than fine, as he thinks he's found the prehistoric powerhouse he was looking for. He then calls out to Raichu and Poliwhirl to ground Aerodactyl for him, and by using a combination of super effective Thunderbolts for Aerodactyl's flying typing, and water guns for its rock, it is only a matter of time before the ancient beast comes crashing to the ground, where Gary can catch it. As Aerodactyl is converted into red light, Ash rises to his feet, scowling that it would have been great if Gary had brought it down without hitting him, but shrugging, Gary says that being a Pokemon trainer is a dangerous business, so if Ashy Boy can't handle it, he should go home like those other washouts and leave the training to the pros. He then begins walking away, having gotten what he came for, and as he and his fans clamber back into the car, it is the sound of Ash seething in the background. As it turns out, Ash is not the only disgruntled one they must deal with, as for the rest of the trip to Cinnabar Island, Aerodactyl wastes no time in expressing how unhappy it is to have been captured only begrudgingly obeying Gary due to the fact that he was strong enough to beat it. Having some experience with this thanks to Raichu, Gary decides to let the rock flying type cool off, focusing instead on working with his other Pokemon. Though in the instances where he does want to train with Aerodactyl, Raichu and Poliwhirl are always on hand. Eventually the gang do arrive on the island, and as Gary had thought, it is nothing but a tourist trap. However, trusting his gramps word, Gary begins scouting for a secret gym, and with the hint that Blaine is a riddle master, it does not take the young oak long to narrow it down to the big riddle inn. Waiting for him here is an old hippie 
Napier congratulates Gary on finding this place, before enigmatically stating that his quest for the gym is almost complete. He just needs to answer a few more riddles, the first of which is... However, before the hippie can begin reciting his riddle, Gary cuts him off, saying he's Blaine, isn't he? Sighing a little, the old man answers that yes, he is, but to find the gym he'll still have to solve his perplexing puzzles, the first of which is... Once more Gary cuts Blaine off, asking why he has to go through all that. He found this place, he found the gym leader, can't they just skip ahead to the battle already? Sighing again, Blaine protests that he thinks the young man will have a more enjoyable experience if he goes along with the plan, but impatiently, Gary retorts that he's on a deadline here, so the best thing for him would be to just get this battle over with so he can move on to his seventh badge. Looking crestfallen, Blaine grumbles that this kid would make him pull his hair out if he still had it, before tossing his wig aside and telling him and his entourage to follow him, since the gym's out back. As they walk, the gym leader continues to mutter that it's not like he put time and effort into setting up these riddles, not to mention money, since setting up a fake hotel isn't cheap, but all the same, when they reach the battlefield at the heart of the volcano, he seems to find himself again, welcoming Gary to the Cinnabar Gym and informing him that this will be a three on three with no time limit. He then reveals his first Pokemon, that being Ninetales, with Gary in turn bringing out Poliwhirl, confident the typing will carry him through. To this end, he calls for Rain Dance, preparing to speed blitz Ninetales just as Poliwhirl did to Raichu and Charmeleon. But unfortunately, here his plan runs into a little snag, as while Poliwhirl can create rain clouds, thanks to being in the heart of a volcano, the rain all evaporates before it can fall on Poliwhirl, thus rendering its advantage null and void. However, this is not the end of Gary's problems, as while he and Poliwhirl have been doing this, Blaine and Ninetales have been prepping their attack, with Blaine having his Firefox use Fire Spin to trap Poliwhirl in a flaming vortex. Desperately, Poliwhirl attempts to get free, though in its current state, it is completely immobilized, with its struggling only resulting in more burns. Finally, when Blaine feels the tadpole Pokemon has endured enough, he tells Ninetale to go in for the finishing blow, and as the fox Pokemon leaps into the tornado of fire, it slams headfirst into Poliwhirl's stomach, sending it soaring backwards into the cave wall, where it slumps unconscious. A little shocked by this turn of events, Gary recalls his water type, then as his cheerleaders shed their encouragement, he brings out one of his twin aces, Nidoking. Having learned from his battle with Noland, Gary is now prepared to make full usage of Nidoking's abilities, and so decides to waste no time in unveiling the drill Pokemon's newly learned ground type move, that being Earthquake. Stomping his colossal feet, the king then proceeds to cause pieces of the rocky battlefield to burst up with his sharp spires, which stab into Ninetales like drills. Though the fox Pokemon attempts to use its speed and agility to avoid these, it is only a matter of time before there is nowhere left to run on the limited battle space. And as a trio of spikes jet up to strike Ninetales, Blaine recalls it, conceding this round and wisely commenting the outcome of this fight was no question. Next up for the Fire Specialist is something of a shocker, that being his Rhydon, with it and Nido King quickly locking eyes and growling fiercely. Smirking a little, Gary taunts that Blaine's just made a big mistake, since his Nidoking is king of the ground types, so Rhydon better just bow down already. However, with a steely glint to his eyes, Blaine retorts they'll just have to see about that, with him ordering Rhydon to use Fury Attack. With a bellow, the rocky rhino charges in, though playing smart, Gary has Nidoking use Earthquake again, trusting in the super effective damage to take care of Rhydon for him. Unfortunately, just like his assumptions around Poliwhirl, this has proven to be erroneous, with Rhydon smashing through the earthly spikes and driving its horn into Nidoking's chest. Growling savagely, Nido King smacks Rhydon away, though even still the rock ground type isn't done, coming back in for another hit and causing the two draw Pokemon to grapple one another. Locking hands and even horns, the duo then proceed to try and push the other back, their fighting style becoming more like Greco-Roman wrestlers, though to the surprise of everyone, it seems they are evenly matched. However, Nido King does have one edge that Rhydon does not, that being his horn, as when he drives it into the other Pokemon's snout, he injects the rocky rhino with a dose of his venom. At once, the tables begin to turn, with Rhydon's movements becoming sluggish as a purple rash appears under its eyes. Capitalizing on this, Nidoking shoves Rhydon to its back, then with a brittle double kick stomp to the face, takes it out in one fell swoop, bringing Blaine down to one. For his last Pokemon, Blaine chooses none other than his ace Magmar, with the fire duck rising from the lava surrounding the ring as it stares down Nido King. Hoping to go for a hat trick, Gary wastes no time in ordering another earthquake, but this time Blaine has a counter, ordering Magmar to use flamethrower on the field. Grunting its name, Magmar does exactly this, bathing the battlefield in flames and subsequently turning it into a molten soup. Suddenly, Nido King's stomping has become a detriment as it causes him to start sinking in the burning ooze, while Magmar as a denizen of the lava lake is able to glide over the top with ease as it zeroes in on Nidoking and lands on his head, driving him face first into the molten rock. Briefly, Nidoking attempts to thrash and free himself, but this is easier said than done while being boiled and drowned at the same time, and so it comes as a little shock when Nidoking soon stops moving and is declared unable to battle. Surveying the battlefield as he recalls Nidoking, Gary realizes he has only one Pokemon he can use, since Executor will just burst into flames the second it leaves its ball, and both Raichu and Raticate will not be able to survive in the magma quagmire Magmar has turned the arena into. This means it's all up to his latest capture, and so gritting his teeth, 
Gary brings out Aerodactyl. Screeching predatorially, the pterodactyl appears in midair, its cunning eyes scanning the battlefield as it identifies Magmar as its prey. Then, without a word from Gary, it swoops, grabbing the Spitfire Pokemon in its talons and attempting to carry it into the air. Unfortunately, Magmar is far too experienced for this, using Fire Punch to strike Aerodactyl in the nose and drive it off with an angry caw. From his side of the field, Gary chides the fossil Pokemon, saying this is why they need to work together, since one of them alone might be strong, but two together are stronger. This caveman logic registers with Aerodactyl, causing the rock flyer to give Gary a look that says, I'll try things your way this time, but if you're wrong, I'll make you my lunch. Taking this somewhat tenuous vote of confidence as a win, Gary tells it to use Takedown, with the rocky reptile acknowledging this and slamming its head into Magmar, just as the fire type does the same with Skullbash. Thanks to Aerodactyl's rockhead ability, it takes no damage from recoil, and so repeats the feat, this time staggering Magmar and allowing it to gain an opening. Wanting to make use of this, Gary calls for an ancient power with the rocky flyer manifesting a series of fossils which home in on Magmar and send it soaring into the sky. Giving chase, Aerodactyl tries once more to grab Magmar, though even in flight Magmar is a fearsome opponent, batting it away with fire punches and landing softly thanks to the molten gooey battlefield. Now it is Blaine's turn to go on the attack, and knowing to risk Aerodactyl pulling off another super effective ancient power, he tells his partner to use their ace in the hole, Fire Blast. At once the Spitfire Pokemon manifests a flaming fire kanji, which strikes Aerodactyl, causing the prehistoric predator to shriek, as there's no only hurt, but inflicted with a burn. Seeing the effectiveness of this, Blaine tells Magma to repeat the move, and as it summons another fiery kanji, Gary feels the walls closing in on him. Thanks to that burn, Aerodactyl's ability to fight physically has been significantly cut down, not to mention the lingering damage will surely take it out, even if this particular fire blast doesn't. This leaves him with only one choice, and as the fire blast is launched upwards, Gary gives his last command, Hyper Beam. Coying ferociously, Aerodactyl does as its bid, blasting down at the flames with a torrent of orange energy, and as the two attacks connect, an explosion rocks the volcano, which almost triggers an eruption. Down on the battlefield, everything's obscured by black smoke, and as Gary coughs and waves it away, he calls out to Aerodactyl, hoping it has fared better than him. Despite his cries, Gary receives no answer, and so braces himself for the worst. Then, as the smoke finally starts to clear, he sees two silhouettes, one prone and unconscious, while the other stands triumphant. In the haze, it's hard to tell who's who, with Gary saying nothing. Then, as the smoke finally dissipates, the boy's face splits into a grin, as he sees Aerodactyl standing over a beaten Magmar, its eyes shining in a way that says Gary has earned its trust with his tactical prowess. After such a heated battle, Gary is glad to be allowed to return to the hotel proper, and as Blaine joins him and his friends, he congratulates the boy on a job well done, saying his battling style is like a riddle, one he was unable to solve. Grinning, Gary tells Blaine not to sweat it, then after receiving his badge, asks the old timer to lead him to one of the baths, preferably a cool one. Following this, the rest of the night is spent enjoying the amenities of the Big Riddle Inn, though their stay is not an extended one, as the next morning, Gary and co make their way to the ferry terminal and board a ship bound for Pallet Town and Gary's seventh badge. Meanwhile, Ash has just arrived on Cinnabar Island, eager to have his gym battle. Like in canon, he is at first disappointed to see the derelict old gym, though after stopping Bruno and Cassidy from robbing the fossil lab, he is rewarded with the hint about Blaine being a riddle master. Using this, he is able to deduce the location of the gym just like Gary did, though unlike the brunette, he is met with no resistance when he says he wants to battle, as even though the last match ended in defeat, it got Blaine all fired up. As a result, Blaine immediately leads Ash down into the gym, where the young man is stunned to see the battlefield suspended over a pit of lava. Nonetheless, he does not back down, expressing eagerness to battle and taking his place across from Blaine. Like usual, the gym leader brings out his nine towels, and as Ash surveys it in the battlefield, he wonders if this is the time to put his sixth and final Pokemon to the test. We resume in the midst of Ash's battle with Blaine. After beating Ninetales, Ash's sixth capture has fallen to Rhydon, though the boy is undeterred, thanking it for its effort and returning it. In its place, he sends out Wartortle, with the tenacious Testudines exuding an aura of cool determination that even the heat of a volcano cannot ruin. Eyeing its smaller opponent suspiciously, Rhydon prepares a horn drill, hoping to take the title out in one. But being ready for this, Ash has Wartortle retreat inside its shell with a rapid spin, which counters the one-hit KO move, while also leaving the water starter in a perfect position to launch a point blank water gun which preys on Rhydon's quad water weakness. Staggering back, the draw Pokemon attempts to find its footing, though Ash isn't giving up his advantage that easily, having Wartortle blast Rhydon again, leaving it unconscious. Now it is time for Blaine's final Pokemon, and like against Gary, this is Magmar. Making the same entrance by rising from the lava, the Spitfire Pokemon approaches Wartortle, seemingly unfazed by the type disadvantage. Meanwhile, Ash has called for another water gun, wanting to get this battle over with, since he's boiling. 
though being Blaine's ace, Magma easily endures this, closing on Wartortle and using Fire Punch to strike it across the face. It then follows up with a Skull Bash that sends Ash's partner crashing face first into the battlefield, before attempting to use the same finisher it did against Gary's Nido King by turning the arena into a vat of lava. However, here it meets some opposition in the form of Wartortle, who despite being prone, is able to muster another water gun, striking any point Magma hits with Flamethrower, and thus impeding its goal. Unfortunately, this is a delaying tactic at best, as Magma's flames burn far hotter than Wartortle is able to cool, with the field still heating up and slowly beginning to liquefy. Knowing that unless it can up its firefighting ability exponentially it will become turtle soup, Wartortle begins putting everything it has into Water Gun, bathing the ground and causing a steam haze to fill the volcanic cavern. Seeing this, Blaine tells Magma to use Fire Blast on Wartortle, and as he predicted, Ash has started to divert its attention from the battlefield to holding back the flaming kanji with its Water Gun. This leaves Magma free to boil the field to its heart's content, as the turtle Pokemon is stuck in place trying to hold back a fiery tide that will engulf at any moment, assuming the rapidly heating ground doesn't take it out first. This is an undeniably dire situation. The Wartortle and Ash have fought their way out of these before, and so thinking of its partner, Wartortle marshals all its remaining strength and lets out a scream as white light consumes it. A moment later a proud Blastoise lies in its place, and by using its two newly acquired cannons along with its mouth, Blastoise is able to triple its water output, easily blowing the Fire Blast away, then turning its attention to Magmar. Against such a powerful deluge, Magmar is unable to keep its footing, being blown back as Blastoise then extinguishes the battlefield, allowing it to rise to its feet and glare at Magmar. Desperately, Blaine makes one more attempt at Skull Bash, though this is far less effective than before, as after bouncing off Blastoise's thickened shell, the Shellfish Pokemon levels its two cannons at its opponent, and blasts it with a two-pronged water gun, which is more than enough to take it out, earning Ash his penultimate badge. Meanwhile, Gary is just about to attempt the same, having arrived at last in Pallet Town. After several months on the road, it is good to be home, and so hopping in his car, Gary and his cohort head up the high street towards Oak's lab. Having heard the boy was coming, Professor Oak is there to greet his grandson, asking if Gary's here to swap his Pokemon for his upcoming gym battles. Though with a shake of his head, Gary reveals that actually he's here to challenge his gramps, since he knows that back in the day he ran a gym right here in Pallet after stepping down as league champion. A little surprised, the Elder Oak says that was a long time ago, before he became a researcher, but with a grin, Gary retorts that even so, if he's going to be the best, he has to beat the best, and that means his gramps. Thanking the youth for the compliment, Oak sighs that he never could say no to Gary. Very well, they'll have a battle here in the corral, and if Gary beats his old friends, he'll give him a blank badge. A moment later, the two oaks find themselves in the wide open pasture behind the lab, with Samuel explaining the rules of this battle. Like the pewter gym, it will be a two on two, though in this case, both Pokemon will be used at once, as a test of teamwork between both trainer and Pokemon, as well as the Pokemon themselves. He then brings out his two Pokemon, a Kangaskhan and a Dodrio, while Gary chooses Poliwhirl and Raichu, with the young man declaring he wants to show his gramps both the fruit of the training he helped him with, and the power of the Pokemon he gave him when he was starting out. Being the challenger, Gary is given the first move, and as has become a staple for him, he opens by telling Poliwhirl to use Rain Dance. Up above, a series of storm clouds begin brewing. Then with a grin, Gary orders Raichu to use Thunderbolt, with it striking the clouds and creating a thunderstorm. Now both rain and lightning fall from the sky, which is good news for Gary's team, though bodes poorly for Oak, as Deirdreo quickly becomes agitated at the sight of its electrical downpour. Nonetheless, Oak looks quite pleased, telling his grandson that mastery of the battlefield is a valuable skill, and when he can see the boy is already mastered. Nodding, Gary replies that his gramps is about to see that he's mastered many skills. He then tells Poliwhirl well to use Double Slap, and at once, the Tadpole Pokemon is upon Kangaskhan, hammering it with a barrage of blows, while from the back, Raichu uses the rain to carry his Thunderbolt to Dodrio, who squawks in pain. However, as Gary is about to learn, he is not the only one who can deal damage, as an Oak's command, Kangaskhan lashes out with Mega Punch, sending Poliwhirl flying, while Dodrio similarly takes flight, blasting Raichu with a tri-attack. Landing in a heap together, the two Challenger Pokemon take a moment to get to their feet, though when they do, it is with fire in their eyes as they repeat their previous moves. Shaking his head a little, Oak tells Gary that while repetition is good in research, as it makes results more accurate, in battling it can be a detriment, as once the opponent knows a trick, they won't fall for it twice. To prove this point, he has Kangaskhan dodge each of Poliwhirl's punches before bopping it once more on the head with Mega Punch, while Dodrio uses the electrical part of its second try attack to block the Thunderbolt before lobbing the move at Raichu. Gritting his teeth, Gary comments that he can see how his Gramps won the Pokemon League, though the old man shouldn't count him out yet, since he's no one-trick Ponyta. He then tells Raichu to stand by, instructing it to dodge and nothing else until he says so, before looking at Poliwhirl and telling it to start shadow boxing with double slaps. Curious to see what Gary is planning, Oak allows this, watching as Raichu darts away from the tri attacks with no reprisal, while Poliwhirl begins boxing the air at rapidly increasing intervals. For a moment, it seems as though Gary is simply stalling. Then, something changes in the young man's eyes, as he tells his Pokemon to go now. At once, the duo spring into action, with Poliwhirl using its incredible rain enhanced speed to close in on Kangaskhan, while Raichu launches another Thunderbolt directly at Dodrio. 
Like last time, Oak employs the same counters, with Kangaskhan dodging before coming in for a hit, while Dodrio readies a try attack. However, here things are different, as when Dodrio absorbs the attack, Gary does not seem troubled, instead telling Raichu to keep feeding the try attack. This caused the yellow orb of the three-pronged move to grow far larger than its counterparts, creating an instability that Dodrio cannot control. Though, this is not the worst of it, as a moment later, Oak realizes what Gary was waiting for, as a bolt of lightning from the storm strikes the try attack finally overloading it and causing it to quite literally blow up in Dodria's face, taking it out of the fight. Meanwhile, Kangaskhan has come in for its retaliatory mega punch, intent on this time taking Poliwall down. However, when it swings, something stops it, a gust of wind emanating from Poliwall's fists, which repel the punch, allowing the water type to move in without fear and uppercut Kangaskhan's jaw. Looking impressed, Oak praises Gary for taking what he said was a weakness and making it into a strength by using the repetition to create a momentum air current that could protect Poliwall. And of course, he is just as pleased by the trust Gary and Raichu have formed, having such synchronicity they could anticipate lightning and use it to score a knockout. Very well done on both counts. Smirking, Gary replies that his Gramps hasn't seen anything yet, as he has Poliwall fall back to stand beside Raichu. Then with a glint to his eyes, he tells the twin fighters to use the move they did against Aerodactyl, with Poliwall and Raichu launching a combined water gun thunderbolt which strikes Kangaskhan head on and takes it down, ending the battle. Applauding proudly, Oak calls this a magnificent battle. Then as promised, he pulls a small white badge from his coat pocket, calling it the Blank Badge. He then also bestows Gary with a second gift, that being a Waterstone, as he says that with its penchant for pugilism, Poliwall might do well to evolve into a Polyrath, so it can make the most of its talents. Nodding, Gary thanks his gramps for the tip, while Poliwall seems just as excited, eager as ever to reap the benefits of evolution, with it quickly reaching out to touch the stone and transcend into its highest form. Though Gary wants to get back on the road and head for Viridian, he knows that his fans will all want to visit their friends and family, and so agrees to spend the weekend here in Pallet Town, before setting out first thing Monday to challenge the gym when it reopens. Unbeknownst to him, someone else has already had this idea, with that being Ash. Arriving in Viridian City on Sunday night, the boy is the first to challenge the gym on Monday, with a man in an orange suit being there to greet him. When Ash says he wants to battle, the orange-clad gym leader who introduced himself as Giovanni tells him the terms of the battle are simple, all his Pokémon against the gym leader's one. Frowning, Ash says this doesn't sound very fair, though with a chuckle, Giovanni responds that it probably isn't, though not in the way Ash thinks. He then presses a button, and with a rumble a door onto the battlefield opens, revealing a Pokemon Ash has never seen before, clad head to toe in armor. What follows cannot truthfully be referred to as a battle, as a massacre would be far more accurate. One by one, Ash's Pokemon fall to the might of this armored monstrosity, with even Blastoise being able to land a single hit, as it is thrown against the wall by Psyche Energy. Soon, Ash is down to his final Pokemon, Charmeleon with the Red Lizard coming to its trainer's defense willingly, in spite of the odds. Like with every other battle against Giovanni's monster, this one starts the same, with the mystery Pokemon using telekinesis to lift Charmeleon into the air and slam it around like a ragdoll before it can do anything. Then, when the Psychic type is sure it can't take any more, it drops its prey in a heap. However, here something different happens, as even after taking this beating, Charmeleon manages to get back up, roaring with fiery passion that will not fail its friend. Then, as if manifesting its claim through will alone, Charmeleon begins to glow, growing wings and horns which grant it a fearsome countenance, as it glowers now at its foe ready to fight for Ash's dream as a Charizard. Something in this seems to grant Ash's Bulbasaur and Blastoise a second wind with the pair rising to their feet to stand beside Charizard. And as the armored beast stares down this trio and their trainer, it feels a pang, like a memory long forgotten, only to be triggered by this sight. Did it ever have friends such as these? The creature doesn't know. The one thing is clear. The sight of the boy now hugging his partners fills it with pain, grief, jealousy. Why must it stand alone in this world? Suddenly, the monster's armor begins to buckle and crack, the emotional upheaval amplifying its psyche abilities beyond its already unprecedented limits. Knowing that he will lose his weapon if he does not act now, Giovanni orders his creation to return to its alcove, though it is already far too late, with the psychic Pokemon shooting upwards through the roof, its destination unclear, though its goal simple. Search the world for someone that an artificial creature such as itself can call a friend. Scowling deeply, Giovanni tosses Ash a badge, declaring that he won by forfeit, while demanding he get out. This is truly a disaster. His property is now missing, and he has no way of knowing where it will appear next. This will require a full-scale operation, and the attention of his top operatives, perhaps even the rising star trio of Jesse, James, and Meowth whatever it takes to recover what is rightfully his. Despite the odd end to this gym battle, Ash is still delighted with the outcome, pinning his Earth Badge to his vest and declaring that he finally got a late, meaning it's time for the Pokemon League. Stepping outside, Ash is met by the sight of Gary and his gang, 
with the brunette leering that he wouldn't have expected to see Ashy Boy here of all places. Refusing to let Gary spoil his good mood, Ash replies that actually he's just leaving, having earned his eighth badge, a fact which seems to annoy the young oak, as he snarks that if a doofus like Ash could win, then this gym must be a piece of cake. Shrugging, Ash replies that Gary will have to wait and see before strolling off. Though before he goes, Gary yells out one more question to his fellow Pallet Town resident, asking if it's true what his gramps said, that Ash's final Pokemon is so rare that even he'd never seen it before. Smirking a little now, Ash simply replies that it is, though if Gary wants to see it, he'll have to make it to the league. He then departs in earnest, leaving the Oak Boy to ponder what this mystery Pokemon could be. To add further fuel to Gary's annoyance, it takes over an hour before he's let into the gym, being informed by the Centurion guards that the gym leader is left on business and that an interim leader will be arriving shortly. Finally, Gary and his friends are allowed into the cavernous gym, and as they step inside, they are met by a resounding cry of, prepare for trouble, and make it double, as the lights come up, revealing none other than Butts and Cassidy. Groaning loudly, Gary demands to know what these two clowns are doing here, with Mitch replying that they're not clowns, they're interim gym leaders, so if he wants their badge, he ought to treat them with a little more respect. Rolling his eyes, Gary decides to play along, asking what the terms of their battle are, with Cassidy replying they'll be using three Pokemon, while he only gets to use one, before bringing out her first Pokemon in Marchamp. Figuring that all three Pokemon will probably be bruises like this considering the duo's previous outings, Gary decides to go with something that can take a hit, and for that job, there's no one better than Executor. Rudely, Cassie decides to take the first move, having Marchamp use Karate Chop, with the superpower Pokemon laying into the palm tree with all four of its hands. However, being the defensive wall that it is, Executor simply ignores this, its three heads looking around as if wondering how they got here. That is until Gary tells it to use Psychic, at which point they all zero on a Marchamp, their eyes glowing. Suddenly, the bulky brawler finds itself as helpless as a newly hatched Magikarp, as it is lifted into the air and sent flying through a wall. Unsurprisingly, this is enough to take it out, meaning Brad is up now, sending out a golem and telling it to use Tackle. Letting out a roar, the burly boulder now tries its hand at throwing itself at Executor, though just like the last guy, the grass psychic type truly does not seem to care, instead retaliating with a Mega Drain that saps golem of its strength and causes it to keel over unable to battle. Down to their last Pokemon already, Bart and Cassidy then throw their final ball together, revealing a Rhydon who actually looks like it might be capable of posing a challenge. That is if its trainers can actually agree on a move, as when it comes time to start, Cassidy orders a stomp while Branch calls for a horn attack, causing Rhydon to look back at the two of them, unsure who to obey. In unison, the two Team Rocket grunts declare that obviously it should listen to them, which only further fractures their teamwork, with the two interim gym leaders quickly devolving into name calling and hair pulling. While Gary could use this opportunity to easily take out Rhydon with another Mega Drive, this is far too amusing, and so he sits back to watch the Team Rocket duo fight. Finally, Rhydon gets fed up with his bickering, causing it to clamber through the whole Marchamp Maiden leave, thus rendering Crunch and Cassidy the losers, as they are now all out of Pokemon. Clearing his throat, Gary tells them to pay up and give him his badge, but now in an even worse mood, the duo decline, bringing out Primeape and Raticate. Though this proves to be a mistake, as now that they've resorted to playing dirty, Gary feels no guilt having Executor use Psychic to hoist them up into the air and shake them by their ankles until an Earth Badge falls out of their pockets, at which point he has Raichu's Thunderbolt to send them blasting off through the conveniently placed hole in the roof from Ash's battle. Collecting his badge, Gary wonders what he should do now, as while there are other gyms in the region, it seems rather pointless to challenge them when Ash already beat him to the finish line by getting his required 8 first. With this in mind, Gary decides the best course of action is probably to go home, since Pallet's pretty close to the Indigo Plateau, and he can wait there until the league starts next month. Consulting with Raichu Executor and his fan club, they all seem to think it's a great idea, and so it is that when he gets back in the car, it is to ask his driver to make a return trip to where they just were. The month that follows is for the most part a rest for one, as while Gary does train with his Pokemon, it is fairly casual, since with them already having gained entry to the league, there is no sense of urgency driving him forward. In contrast, Ash spends this last month undertaking multiple training excursions for Professor Oak, often having to rise early and be gone for days at a time. For his trouble, he comes across figures such as Bruno of the Elite Four, Professor Westwood the Fifth, who was Oak's collaborator for the Pokédex, and even remnants of an ancient civilization called Pokémopolis. Finally, the fateful day arrives, with both Gary and Ash travelling to the Indigo Plateau for the start of the Pokemon League. In spite of their differences, both are excited to prove themselves in the main stadium, that to do so, first they must win their way up through the preliminaries. For his first match, Gary finds himself in a rocky battlefield, facing off with a similarly rocky named Pete Pebbleman, and though the young man does not use rock types, his ace cloister proves just as difficult to crack, taking down Aerodactyl thanks to the prehistoric Pokemon's weakness to ice. Luckily, if anything can crack Cloyster's hard shell, it is Raticate's super effective jump kick, which nets Gary the win and brings him to the second round. 
Meanwhile, Ash's match against Melissa on the waterfield goes just as well, as it gives Blastoise ample opportunity to make use of its powerful cannons and swimming speed to gain a 3-0 victory. The remaining three preliminaries go just as easy for our two protagonists, with them finding themselves in the top 16 before they even know it. Here, Ash finds himself up against a boy who bears a striking resemblance to himself, named Richie, though with no Team Rocket to interfere, and no ties of friendship to give him doubts, his Charizard, Pidgeotto and Bulbasaur are easily able to overcome Zippo, Happy and Sparky, sending Ash to the top 8. Gary's top 16 opponent proves slightly more challenging, as is a young woman named Jeanette Fisher, whose final Pokemon Bellspur is known for having unbeatable dodge and prowess. This skill has made her the odds on favourite to win the whole conference. That is until Gary's Nidoking stomps the little weed into the dirt until it can't move anymore, at which point Gary becomes the odds on favourite. Here however something occurs that was always bound to happen sooner or later. Ash and Gary are matched up for the right to advance to the semi-finals. Locking eyes from across the room, the two lifelong rivals then give each other determined looks, with no words being necessary, as they both reach the same conclusion, that tomorrow they will put this rivalry to bed and settle the score once and for all. The following morning, the two boys make their way into Indigo Stadium, where a crowd of thousands eagerly awaits their bout. As they take their places, they are informed this will be a full 6 on 6 with no time limit, Then, as the ref waves his flags, they are told to begin. At once, Gary and Ash each bring out their first Pokemon, with Gary choosing his Poliwrath, while Ash goes for a slim purple feline that Gary's never seen before. This must be the mystery Pokemon his Gramps mentioned, and so pulling out his Pokédex, which was thankfully updated during his stay in Pallet, he points to the creature, with Dexter telling him that it is Espeon, the Sun Pokemon, an evolution of Eevee. It also tells him that it's a Psychic type, a fact which troubles Gary, as his Poliwrath is weak to Psychic type attacks. As a result, the young oak wastes no time in switching out, recalling Poliwrath, and replacing it with his Exeggutor. This should at least give Gary some security, as Exeggutor is resistant to all psychic attacks, meaning Gary can gauge his unfamiliar Pokemon's ability without running the risk of losing any of his Pokemon as he does. However, it seems that Gary isn't the only one trying to assess the situation, as Ash orders Zespion to rush in with quick attack, letting a confident meow, the Lilac Cat dashes its foe, slamming headfirst into the thick trunk of Exeggutor and bouncing off harmlessly. Mockingly, Gary taunts that when his Gramps told them to battle with their heads, this isn't what he meant. Though grinning, Ash replies this was just a warm-up, as he next calls for Psybeam. Suddenly, a psionic beam of energy shoots out of the gem on Espeon's head, though here Gary has a counter, calling for Egg Bomb, with Exeggutor launching several egg-shaped orbs of energy which strike the cat just as the psychic laser hits Exeggutor. As a result, both Pokemon take damage, though it appears as though Gary is the winner in that exchange, as the smaller feline comes out of it looking worse for wear. Nonetheless, Ash seems undeterred, telling Espeon that it's the best and urging it to try Psychic this time. Nodding, Espeon begins to glow with blue Psychic Aura, and so not wanting to be outdone, Gary gives the same command with Exeggutor also taking on the blue hue. For a moment, it seems like nothing is happening, as the two Pokemon have a stare down. Then, in the centre of the battlefield, cracks begin to form as faint blue sparks appear in the air. This is a game of psychic tug-of-war, as both combatants attempt to push their unseen wall of psychic energy past the other so they can strike their opponent with the force of both. Though conventional wisdom would suggest that three heads are better than one in a battle of wits, this fails to take into account the intelligence of these heads, as three dopes can hardly be considered a match for one crafty kitty. And so it is that a moment later, the stalemate breaks, with Exeggutor being flung back, having lost the psychic duel, and now suffering the consequences of having its brains fried. Subsequently, when it crashes to the ground, it is with Spiral's fries, having been summarily felled. Grinning his teeth, Gary next chooses Raichu, trusting his raw power to be more than a match for Ash's newest capture. Like last time, Ash calls for quick attack, though this time Gary does likewise, with the two Pokemon proving to be roughly even in terms of speed. This results in a number of fast-paced clashes, as the two Pokemon attempt to assert dominance, though having the bulk advantage, it is clear that Raichu will win in that regard. Changing tack, Ash next calls for a Psybeam, though here Gary is able to match it, ordering a Thunderbolt. Once more, the two attacks meet in the middle, though like with the quick attack clashes, Raichu proves itself SP on Superior, breaking through and sending the twin-tailed cat flying. Here too a piece of long-held belief is disproven, as though cats are always said to land on their feet, this is not the case with Espeon, who lands painfully on its side, digging a trench through the battlefield as it comes to rest unconscious at Ash's feet. However, Raichu also seems rather drained from this encounter, causing Gary to recall it in favour of Nidoking, as Ash in turn brings out his Beedrill. At once the King glares daggers at his opponent, as if questioning how dare a measly bug challenge him. Or being a timid soul, Beedrill quails a little under this gaze. That is until Ash reassures that everything is okay, and that all it needs to worry about is having fun out there. This does comfort the bug somewhat, so that when the call is given to begin, it is able to parry Nido King's horn attack with one of its stingers, as the poison ground type goes in the attack. This quickly becomes the way of things, as Nido King attempts to use his size and strength to keep Beedrill in the defensive. However, to Beedrill's credit, it is able to keep up, using its nimble and acrobatic air 
aerial sword fighting technique to keep Nidoking from gaining any opening to finish it off, a feat few can boast. Naturally, this infuriates the domineering Nidoking, with his moves becoming more erratic and aggressive as he attempts to pin down this troublesome insect, something that only favours Beedrill, as it starts finding openings to get a few hits of its own in the midst of the draw Pokemon's rage. Eventually, however, Nidoking does manage to corner Beedrill, yanking it from the air and stomping it into submission, though as it loses consciousness, the Poison Bee Pokemon knows that its efforts weren't for nothing, as it has laid the foundations that will lead to the toppling of the king. Next up for Ash is Charizard, with the flame Pokemon taking to the field with a roar. On Ash's command, it then begins using Rage, while Gary in turn has Nidoking use Horn Attack, resulting in a clash of bulky bruises as the pair use any appendage at their disposal to throttle their foe. Unfortunately, this clash of the titans proves inconclusive, as the duo are of comparable strength, meaning that if either are going to pull out a win, they will have to rely on skills more than strength. As a result, Gary yells for a Poison Sting, with Nidoking couching his horn like a lance and charging around Charizard. However, in contrast, Ash seems unfazed, telling Charizard to wait, then at the last second, having it use Seismic Toss. At once, the Fire Lizard's arms dart out, wrapping Nidoking in a bear hug before launching into the air. Desperately, the draw Pokemon attempts to break free, but it is no good, as the G-Force keeps him pressed against Charizard, as the Flame Pokemon starts making its rotations. Round and round the pair go, until Charizard finally feels ready to take the plunge, at which point it dives at tremendous speeds, playing chicken with the ground. Then, at the last possible moment, it pulls up, while tossing Nidoking so that he takes the full brunt of the impact. Such an attack is too much for even the king, and so when Charizard touches down, it is to stand over the body of its vanquished foe. However, even in defeat, Nidoking has one last barb to hurl at Charizard. Quite literally, in fact, as on closer inspection, Ash sees that his dragon has been poisoned by Nidoking's poison sting after all. Remembering what Melanie taught him about poisons, Ash decides to recall Charizard for now, resulting in a clean slate battlefield for this next round. Weighing their options, Ash and Gary next bring out Bulbasaur and Raticate respectively, a fitting match as both are the unsung heroes of their teams. Squaring up, the two then charge at each other, with Raticate using Super Fang while Bulbasaur retaliates with Vine Whip. Breaking apart, the pair then resort to a couple of old faithfuls, that being Jump Kick and Razor Leaf, as Raticate springs into the air kicking away the leaves as they appear, while Bulbasaur leaps out of the way, resulting in a crash landing. Letting out a chitter of pain, Raticate then scrambles to its feet, only to be bound by Vine Whip as Bulbasaur prepares to use Sleep Powder, knowing that in this league, sleeping and fainting are considered one and the same. However, being a crafty trainer, Gary tells Raticate to bite Bulbasaur's vine as soon as the powder fills the air. A clever tactic, as while grass types are usually immune to these sort of powder moves, a direct injection of the soporific chemicals into the seed Pokemon's bloodstream is quite another matter. And so it is that when the sleep powder coats Raticate's teeth, it chomps down, giving the grass type a taste of its own medicine. Unfortunately, this does little to protect Raticate from the sleep powder, being that once again the rat has taken one for the team, though in doing so, has removed a dangerous foe. And just like that, both trainers are down to three Pokemon each, with Ash choosing his Pidgeotto while Gary goes with Aerodactyl. Coing proudly, Pidgeotto readies itself to go on the attack. After all its hard work and effort, this is a chance to prove itself. Fondly, it thinks back on all the good times it has had with Ash since meeting him on the first day of his journey, though, in allowing itself to get lost in the past, it fails to keep its eye on the present, specifically how Presently, a big fossil is flying right at its face until it strikes it head on and takes it out in one, reminding everyone why Aerodactyl was once king of the skies. Now, with the tide back in Gary's favor, Ash is forced to choose his next Pokemon carefully. Though Blastoise would be a smart pick, he wants to save his starter for the end, meaning he really only has one option, with that being Charizard. Letting out a somewhat groggy roar, the flame Pokemon takes the field once more, causing Gary to sniff that if Ashy Boy is trying to throw the match at this point, he could just save them all the time and surrender. However, this taunt proves to be a mistake stake, as it lights a fire in Charizard's eyes, giving it the strength to rise to defend its best friend. Nonetheless, Gary and Aerodactyl aren't that worried, with the Oak Boy calling for another ancient power in the hope that this will be another one-hit KO. Unfortunately, Ash and Charizard have no intention of allowing this, with the dragon launching itself into the air and dodging the fossil, before coming in for a rage-powered punch that leaves Aerodactyl reeling. Refusing to lose this advantage, Charizard then begins to pummel the rocky flyer, striking with its claws, legs, tail, and even head as it drives the prehistoric Pokemon into the dirt. Soon, Aerodactyl finds itself buried in a crater, with a furious dragon standing over it, an unenviable position if ever there was one. However, it is not out of tricks yet, as when Ash calls for Flamethrower to finish it off, Gary has the ancient avian use Hyper Beam, bathing Charizard in orange light and leaving it nowhere to be seen. 
For a moment, Gary worries that he accidentally disintegrated the lizard with Aerodactyl's awesome power, but then he sees it, having flown up at the last moment and seemingly outpaced the point-blank blast. Gary would be impressed if not for the fact that now Aerodactyl needs a moment to recharge, and seeing this vulnerability, Charizard capitalizes, laying down a volley of dragon rages which the fossil Pokemon cannot avoid, and more importantly, cannot withstand, bringing the match back to two all. Even a jolt of poison through the lizard's veins cannot lessen its good mood as it lands, with Ash hugging it and calling it incredible. Breathing fire is a sign of determination, Charizard roars that it will face whoever Gary is next for it, though when its eyes land on its opponent, it can't help but smile. So Poliwhirl has evolved too. Good. It's been itching for this rematch. Meanwhile, Poliwrath has made its way onto the field, feeling similarly eager at the sight of Charizard, with the two Pokemon almost having a false start as they lunge forward just as the ref calls for the match to begin. At once they open with a clash of double slap and rage, resuming the slugfest from Grandpa Canyon. Now they know there will be no interruptions. Quickly, this magnifies into an all-out brawl, as both Pokemon attempt to prove how far they've come since their last match, with Poliwrath making use of its newly acquired fighting typing to hit all the harder, while Charizard uses its size and weight advantage to deliver some devastating blows of its own. However, despite all their growth, it seems the pair are evenly matched, meaning when they break apart is to consider strategies that might help them turn the tide. For Poliwrath, this is obvious, as by using Rain Dance, it's able to become the speedy striker is trained to be, though here Charizard has a natural counter in the form of its wings, taking to the air and neutralizing all of Poliwrath's punching power. Luckily, Poliwrath is also a skilled ranged fighter, launching a water gun which makes the dragon hiss in pain, before it retaliates with a dragon rage, which likewise wounds Poliwrath. Unfortunately for Ash, he isn't so sure if Charizard can repeat this feat, as when more poison damage causes Charizard to wobble in the air, he knows this battle cannot last much longer. To this end, he tells his friend to put everything it has into a flamethrower, while Gary in turn tells his Poliwrath to do the same with Water Gun. Fire and Water then clash in mid-air, causing steam to erupt throughout the field, though unlike before, this is not a battle of equals, as between the rain, the poison, and the fact that it had to fight Aerodactyl, Charizard is far too weak to hang on, with the Water Gun consuming the flames and striking the lizard head-on, taking it out. As Charizard hits the ground, Poliwrath scowls, recognizing all the disadvantages Charizard was at, and so as Ash recalls it, the tadpole Pokemon makes a promise to battle its rival again someday, under fairer conditions. Last up for Ash is none other than his starter Blastoise, with the shellfish Pokemon bellowing fiercely as it takes to the field. Wanting to watch the bad taste of that last match from its mouth, Poliwrath then opens fire with Water Gun before Gary can even command it. Though this proves to be a mistake, as on Ash's command, Blastoise is easily able to meet this with a twin cannon hydro pump, which far surpasses the tadpole single stream, washing the move and its user away in one fell swoop. Now at last it is down to the final clash, starter versus starter, with Raichu retaking the field as he smirks at Blastoise. Even with type advantage against them, Ash shows no hesitancy as he turns his cap backwards and tells his partner to give it his all and order the titanic tortoise is happy to obey, taking a running leap and slamming into Raichu with their signature rapid spin. In retaliation, Gary has Raichu's Thunderbolt, the due to Blastoise being inside its shoulder spin, this damage is somewhat mitigated. Re-emerging, Blastoise then goes for another Hydro Pump, hoping to make short work of Raichu like it did Poliwrath, though here at least Raichu is able to get the better of it, scurrying forward to avoid the deluge, then electrocuting its foe at point-blank range. This promptly sends Blastoise staggering, and being who he is, Gary does not hesitate to follow up, having Raichu zap the turtle again and setting it toppling onto its back. Briefly, it seems like this might be curtains for Ash and Blastoise, though when the boy cries for his friend, the water type finds the will to get back up, continuing the fight. Acknowledging this gutsy move, Raichu makes no move to attack until Blastoise is back on its feet, though when it is, the onslaught continues, with it this time using quick attack to deliver a blow to the water starter's face. At this range, Blastoise is unable to hit Raichu with its cannons, though this is not the only trick it has, as by withdrawing its head into its shell, it is able to launch it like a piston, driving a powerful skull bash into the mouse, which sends it bouncing back across the field. By now, neither Pokemon is looking too crash hot, and so in a bid to end things in their favour, both Ash and Gary give what may well be their final order, Thunderbolt for Gary and Hydro Pump for Ash. As one, the two Pokemon then open fire, and as their attacks meet in the middle, a mighty explosion rocks the stage, kicking up dust and obscuring everything. When it fades, both Raichu and Blastoise remain on their feet, though only just as they sway woozily. Desperately, both trainers cry for their stars to push just a little bit harder and get in one last attack, though it seems that both Pokemon have already gone beyond their limits, as when Raichu takes one last staggering step to initiate a quick attack, he instead falls forward, crashing to the ground and giving the battle to Ash. For a moment, Gary cannot believe what he is seeing. How did he, Gary Oak, lose? And to an idiot like Ash? It doesn't make any sense! 
However, this isn't entirely true, and as a buzzing fills his ears, a small voice in his own head points out that this isn't his first loss to Ash. After all, Ash did start before him, taking the starter he wanted. Then, when he took a vacation in Porta Vista, Ash got ahead of him in their gym challenge, a lead he never lost, with the Ravenhead boy getting eight badges first. Though he hates to admit it, Ash has been pulling ahead of him for a long time now, and this match has definitively proven that he has truly surpassed him at last. Having no reason to stick around now that he's been eliminated from the conference, Gary and his crew head back to Pallet Town to regroup. Over the next few days, Gary finds himself lost in thought, trying to figure out what exactly it is about Ash that allowed him to surpass someone like him who had every advantage. As he does with most important matters, Gary eventually turns to his Gramps for advice, visiting him at his lab on the day of the Pokemon League Finals. Heading into the living room, he finds the old man watching the final clash on TV, which to Gary's surprise, sees Ash facing off with a blue-haired girl the commentators call Asunta. Currently, Ash's Blastoise is using Hydro Pump against Asunta's Ivysaur, which is using Solar Beam, and though the smart money would be on the Grass type, somehow Ash manages to defy the odds again, with Hydro Pump breaking through and striking Ivysaur, taking it down, and making Ash catch him the newest winner of the Pokemon League. Taking a seat beside his Gramps, Gary somewhat dejectedly asks how Ash does it. How does he keep coming out on top when he shouldn't? Smiling, the professor comments that it sounds like Gary's been giving this a lot of thought, so does he not have any theories of his own? Shaking his head, Gary replies that he's completely at a loss, a claim which makes Oak sigh, as he admits that he supposes it would be a hard question for Gary to figure out being who he is. He then looks the boy in the eye and says quite simple, Ash succeeds because he's willing to pay the price for his success. This doesn't make anything clearer to Gary, who asks what his Gramps is talking about, causing the old man to chuckle as he elaborates that Gary always assumes he will succeed at whatever he does, with any failure he encounters being an aberration, and he has good reason to, as he is an intelligent, well-liked, and talented young man who has no trouble getting whatever he wants. This is even evident in the way Gary built his team, as four of his Pokemon evolved with the use of stones, which were a means to gain immediate evolutionary power boosts, while the other two had no need to evolve at all, with one coming to him fully evolved, and with the benefit of trading, while the other had no evolution to speak of. In short, they are like Gary himself, a gifted team who needed to put in very little work to be where they are. In contrast, look at Ash's team, a ragtag group of starters, early rat Pokemon, and a fluffball better suited to be a pet than a battler. Everything they achieved, they achieved through hard work, and most importantly, through failure. Since unlike Gary, Ash does not assume he will succeed. He believes it, but he does not take it for granted in the way the young oak does. As a result, when failure arises, Ash does not view it as something to be ashamed of. He instead looks to see what he can learn from it, so he can be better moving forward, since that is the other secret Ash knows, that failure is only final if he chooses it to be. By now Gary thinks he understands what his Gramps is getting at, and even shoots the old man a searching gaze as he asks if he was expecting him to come talk to him. Smiling, Oak replies that he was hoping Gary would, since it has shown that the boy is still open to learning, something that will be very important in his next journey. Curiously, Gary asks where his journey might be too, but still smiling, Oak replies that only Gary can figure that out, though with his Pokemon by his side, and his newfound humility to guide him, he has every confidence the boy will be just fine wherever he chooses to go, and whatever he chooses to do. A few hours later sees Gary back on the road again, travelling by foot this time, with only Raichu by his side. Though his destination remains a mystery to him, he knows the only way he can find it is by following the path ahead and learning from whatever is thrown at him. As he walks, a storm begins to brew, similar to the one on the first day of his travels so long ago. Hunkering down with Raichu under a tree, the pair watches the Pokemon of the forest react, with some reveling in the water while others flee from the downpour. It is a fascinating sight, though nothing can compare to what the pair see when the rain dies down. A magnificent rainbow bird Pokemon, breaking through the clouds and leaving light in its wake. Gary has never seen any Pokemon like this before, and as it passes overhead bound for parts unknown, the young oak is reminded of a simple fact. Even if this part of his adventure is finished, there will always be another, as the journey never truly ends. And that's where we'll leave the story of what if Ash woke up on time. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts in the comments below. And I will see you as the journey continues.